Good evening and uh, welcome to the PBSD board meeting. We have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Urania Lopez. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la Juente Directiva de PBUSD. Disponemos de tradición en español. Si necesita ese apoyo, consulte a Urania Lopez. Okay, and I'd like to take a moment to share that if someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, they must complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria prior to the agenda item, and each speaker will have two minutes. And although I see a lot of new faces here tonight, I would like to take a moment to establish some ground rules. There may be differences of opinion, sometimes strong differences. Please give those speaking the same respect that you would like to receive when you are speaking. This will allow everyone to be heard and the president and the board to conduct its necessary business. And now I um, will ask Trustee DeSerfa to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance as soon as she could set her stuff down. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. <clears throat> and now we will move to item 3.3, our superintendent comments. Our superintendent, Murray Shackman, will make a few comments. Thank you, President Acosta. Welcome, everybody. Sorry we were, uh, we were a little delayed tonight. Um, I want to report on a couple things tonight. Uh, there's a fun theme, career technical ed. We're going to have a, a board report about the program in general in our school. We're going to honor career technical ed with a resolution and then we're going to have a teacher who Ms. Acosta saw teach and invited him to come up and talk about his program because he was at a CTE conference sponsored by AFT in New York City. So we'll hear that. So it's kind of a CTE theme tonight. The second thing, um, on February 24th, if you have kids who want books for free, the PVFT and our district administration are sponsoring a book giveaway. Thank you to the AFT for providing 30 to 40,000 books. We have lots of volunteers that are helping uh, to get that day ready. So that's 10 to 3 on Saturday, the 24th at Watsonville High in the cafeteria. And at the same time, you can have your teeth cleaned right next door for free. Now, if you work for the district, you have good coverage, but uh, we're working with an organization called California Heals. They have 30 volunteer dentists. We do need another optometrist, or several, because they wanted to give away, they want to do free vision. February 24th at Watsonville High. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Sheckman. Uh, now we will move to governing board comments. And this is the opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. And we are going to start with our student, Trustee Ruby. Thank you, President Acosta. Um, good evening and happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Uh, I would like to use my time today to say that I've witnessed firsthand community members and students actively participating in late board meetings to voice their concerns. And thus far, the board has demonstrated a commitment to actively listening and making decisions that align with the expressed needs and opinions. And with that, I would like to strongly recommend bringing the CRE contract back on the agenda and renewing it to continue to support ethnic studies teams and students. Thank you. Thank you to our student trustee and trustee Bolano Scow. Thank you, President Acosta. Thank you everybody for being here and watching us. I'm gonna keep it really brief. I just wanna thank all the parents, teachers, community members who have been in touch with me about several important items before the school board uh, helps me do a better job. I'll keep it moving, we're a little late. Thank you so much. Keep being in touch, it's very important for everybody to be in touch with the board. More communication is better than less communication. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Balanoscal. Now, Trustee Dr. Holm. Um, I attended the district benefits uh, committee meeting. Some highlights are that they're working on an updated FAQ page to let, um, get good information out to district employees. Uh, switching to a more user-friendly retirement manager system in the ne next fiscal year. And uh, I also wanted to mention, you know, uh, PVFT will be hosting several uh, CalSTRS workshops. So thank you, PVFT, for supporting your members. Um, 
I also attended the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation meeting. Just a reminder that we will be having a fundraiser um, event at Jalisco's on April 18th at 6 p.m. And there will be a great, there will be great auction items, so that'll be a lot of fun. Um, I also attended the agenda setting committee meeting, of course, and I, I want to say that while we have not come to a resolution about bringing back the CRE contract, I did reach out to Dr. Allison Santiago Cobales last weekend and had a phone conversation with her. Um, there have been many, so many comments about her viewpoints and motivation. I wanted to take a moment and talk to her directly um, and you know, hear what her viewpoint was from her. Um, I basically go to the source. Uh, I, I hold five science degrees, four related to nursing. And one of the basic tenets of research is to use primary sources if they're available. Um, so, and she's available. So um, I would encourage the board to consider best practices when it comes to gathering and evaluating evidence. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm and Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. Uh, I look forward to uh, this weekend when we will be reviewing superintendent candidates and hopefully find the great next fit for our district. We'll be doing that on Saturday and Sunday. I wanted to wish all of our staff um, and cabinet and everybody out here tonight who is attending a very happy Valentine's Day. I know many of you have taken time away from the person that you love tonight and so I thank you for being here and happy Valentine's Day to everybody. And I echo um, Trustee Scow's um, comments about uh, correspondence. We received uh, much correspondence from parents, and I'm glad they have feedback for us. And we're working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa and Vice President Soto. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending tonight. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody out there. Um, yeah, I'd like to reiterate what uh, Trustee DeSerpa stated regarding the uh, search for the superintendent. Uh, looking forward to that this weekend, and uh, hopefully we find the right candidate to to continue to lead us in the proper direction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice President Soto. Um, I am going to keep my comments brief, and again, I will echo what uh, Superintendent Shackman said. Sorry that we were starting late this evening. Um, we had much to unpack in closed session, um, and I also just want to state for the public record that Trustee uh, Flores, she does have an excused absence from this evening's meeting. Um, I will also echo um, the same as both uh, Vice President Soto and Trustee DeSerpa said. We are looking forward to um, a very packed weekend. Um, so far, we have one of those meetings scheduled for Saturday the 17th. We do have a vote for the eight Sunday the 18th. I'm not going to presume to count the vote until we're there. Um, but seeing such, we looks like we will probably have two meetings this weekend for that. Um, I also wanted to, again, also thank community input for what we're um, receiving from you all. We do appreciate that. We are taking that into consideration and looking at that going forward um, in the process of everything that we are going through as a board. I also wanted to take a quick brief moment um, to thank Superintendent Sheckman for joining me on a tour at McQuitty School with Principal Milburn. We had a wonderful tour there. And also um, Principal Gregorio for the tour at Watsonville High. We had a wonderful tour there as well. It was really enjoyable to go to all the different classrooms and also to see what's happening at both schools. And also more specifically to Watsonville High with some improvements to a field that they're doing there. And want to give a shout out to Driscoll's to thank them for their financial support to Watsonville High School in supporting those endeavors for the um, field replenishment they're doing there. Now I will move to item 3.5, High School Student Board Representatives Report. Do we have any student representatives from Renaissance High School this evening? Welcome. Please come on up. Hello. Okay. Hi, my name is Gia Silva. And my name is Rodrigo Marquez. And we're here to talk about Renaissance High School and the quarter three update. Oh. This one? Oh. Let me 
this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. For the student of the month, the school and the teachers get to vote on a student, and that student has to go to the Rotary meeting to give a speech about the school and how it benefited them and get a certificate at the end. As you can see, through the month of January, it was me and Brian Gonzalez. Renaissance High School had 86% pass passing rate for quarter two, meaning 86% students passed all of their five classes. 15, er, 15 students graduated early, five students returned to their school of residence, and we welcomed 28 new students for quarter three. Mm, field trips. Students went to Henry Cowell Park, State Park, and toured the park. Sports. For sports, we have volleyball, basketball, and soccer. This, this quarter is a basketball team, and we have a boys team, which I am on, and a co-ed team. For college trips, on Friday, we were able to tour the Hartnell College, and yesterday, we went to the Gal Gavin Lynn College. I went to the Gavilan College and I got to talk to the students at the college and tour the campus. This was definitely an amazing opportunity. This was the Gavilan College from yesterday. A couple of co a couple of colleges, firemen and marines come to the school and host an orientation for the students and teach us more about the opportunities they offer for us. After every quarter, the students who pass all their classes get placed in a raffle to win a smart TV, which our principal provides for us. The school hosts a the school also hosts a pizza party for the students who had perfect attendance last quarter for more motivation. We want to thank our principal, Mr. Wilson, for making all this happen and for bettering our school. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have any student representatives here this evening from Aptos High School? Is it video? Okay, we have a video. Let's take a look at some awesome activities that occurred over the last couple of weeks. In mid-November, we did our Empty Bowls fundraiser. Everyone's efforts allowed us to raise enough money to generate 7,068 healthy meals for our families in our community. Also, in the fall, we did our annual drive for fundraiser, where Aptos High students raised $19,117 for their clubs and organizations. A huge shout out to the following organizations who raised the most money. In first place, raising $5,720 goes to our dance team. In second place, raising $1,885 goes to our pool ball team. And in third place, raising $1,425 goes to our flag football team. It is so amazing to see Mariners raising money for their causes and the things of bringing happiness. Nice work, everyone. Towards the end of November, we celebrated our students' accomplishments during Five Star Fest. More students got involved for Five Star Fest than any other event this year, including homecoming. We had hundreds of students redeemed for prizes. Thank you to all the staff who worked on getting donations and thank you to our generous parents and thank you to boosters for your support. We hope you enjoy your prizes and keep up those positive behaviors, Mariners. Last weekend was the annual dance showcase. It was such a fun day full of support and entertainment. We are all so impressed by all the dancers at the showcase. Way to represent Aptos High well. Here is some footage of this epic day.
Student Senate has been discussing in their meetings. Together, they discussed and voted on two campus issues they'd like to try and address this school year. The main issue student senators are concerned about is the misuse of bathrooms, such as vaping and vandalism. Vandalism costs our schools so much time and money and results in bathrooms being unusable and closed. This presents an issue for the rest of us and has become a huge school-wide problem. Vaping is illegal for teenagers and can lead to lifelong health problems. It can also lead to suspension from school. We could do way better, Mariners, and we need to think about how our actions impact other people. The student senators are working on solutions to make sure these problems go away. Thank you, Aptos High. Um, do we have any representatives? Oh, from New School, and I believe we have a video from New School. Is it DTI or New School? Okay, no worries. Okay, Diamond Tech Institute. Sorry, that's okay. So we have a presentation now. I just want to clarify that was new school. Eva and I had it correct on the first shot. And if everyone noticed, they're having their 30th anniversary celebration of new school 
Community Day School on March 1st, 2024 from 4 to 7 p.m. So please feel free to join them. Um, moving on um, to item 4.1, I need an approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. I'll second. I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? The motion carries five um, zero two. Thank you. Um, next, I have a um, five point one approval of the January twenty fourth, twenty twenty four board meeting minutes. I need a motion to approve. Motion. Thank second. You. Thank you. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's a five zero two. Um, 5.2, approval of the January 31st, 2024, special board meeting minutes. May I have a motion to approve? I move to approve. Second. Thank you. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that motion will carry 502 as well. And next, we will be moving to our public hearing um, for item 6.1, expanded school year general waiver request. And this report will be presented by Heather Gorman our SELPA Director of Special Services. Welcome, and I'll call the public hearing. Good evening, there was a typo in that. It's extended school year program for special services. So it's ESY, I, that might have been my fault there. So um, this is a general waiver that I'm asking for that actually gets um, approved. The final approval goes to the CDE. Sorry. <laughs> so the purpose of the waiver. So this will allow special education students. Oh, good evening, President Acosta. Sorry, <laughs> was gonna. President Acosta, Board of Trustees, um, Interim Superintendent Checkman. I'm Heather Gorman, the SELPA Director. So I'll get to this now. So the waiver is going to allow our special education students to attend the summer school program for the same hours as our general education um, students will be attending their program. Um, the program will be about 6.5 hours for um, our students. The dates are, that are proposed will be June 11th through June 28th, which is 13 days and 84.5 hours. And then also in July, I'm working with Jen Bruno, you'll see a presentation later about a, additional activities that students can attend. Um, so we'll be talking about that. So the current state minimum requirements for um, extended school year for students with special needs, um, we are required to have a four week program minus our holidays. Uh, four hours per day is the minimum. Um, it's for students who qualify for extended school year and currently we have 382 students in PVUSD who qualify. And then the total days and hours, which are, would be 17 days and 68 hours. So as you can see, even though we're shortening the, that to three weeks, um, we're actually gonna have more teaching time with the students. So the waiver requirements that we have to do, we have to have a public hearing, which is what's happening right now. And then hopefully we will get board approval later tonight. I will be bringing this to our community advisory committee for any parent feedback on February 27th. Um, so parents can ask questions. We can talk about what, what this would look like then. Um, we did have to take this to our bargaining units and um, Mr. Saxton did that for me and we were looking for either a positive, a neutral or a negative response and we did get a positive response and then I submit the waiver to CDE for the final approval. Um, the benefits of this waiver, so if we actually do the same hours and times as general education, there's more um, benefits for inclusion or time for inclusion. Um, we're always trying to entice staff, our regular staff to um, work summer school, so we're hoping that this will be a positive in having time off in July. Um, it has additional teaching time so we can have more project-based learning opportunities. 
there's going to be additional enrichment opportunities for our students alongside of our general education students. And then overall, we have the benefit of um, district construction having that time in July where we won't have students in our schools so that we can do the deep cleaning, we can do the projects that need to get done and be ready for our school in August. And so that is the general waiver if you have any questions. Thank you, um, Heather. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board. Does the board, anyone have any questions, comments? Trustee DeSerpa? Do you need a motion? No, this is a no, motion. just a I'll be back later. Hearing. Okay, <laughs> great. I don't have any questions. Okay, wonderful. Anyone else? Okay, Thank seeing you none, all. I will close public hearing. Thank you, Ms. Gorman. Mm -hmm. And now we will move on to item 7.1, um, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please know that through the Brown, the Brown Act prohibits the board from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items, but we are listening. Do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. We have 17 speakers tonight, and I will call you up three at a time. And forgive me if I mispronounce your name, and feel free to correct me. Uh, the first three will be Raddy Kirkman, Nat Lowe, and Eli Davies. Come on up. And again, I'll just take this moment to remind everyone that um, all speakers have two minutes. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so, this is the time of year uh, where our probationary colleagues will start receiving notices of what is referred to as a non reelect, meaning that they are not invited back with a position next year. This is a right of the administration provided in Ed Code. Um, and teaching is a very, very difficult job, and there's a purpose for this process, right? Not everybody is cut out for these positions. Um, but what I want to speak to you tonight is what I have seen this year has been nothing I have seen in previous years, and, and it's honest to God disheartening. Disheartening in a time when we are at such a lack of teachers. There's such a teacher shortage across the, across the nation. Um, these are just there's no other word, abysmal evaluations that are being shared with me. Um, and they're not reflections of the teachers that they are being provided to. They're a direct reflection of poor administration. I'm seeing what amounts to essentially a copy and paste on evaluations. In some cases, the pronouns are incorrect for the individuals. What that tells me is that they're not looking at what this teacher is doing, what they're providing to students in the classroom. There has been not one positive thing written, not one piece of actual evidence provided to these members. Um, and what I, what I want to share with the board is this, this often reflects on not, not the quality of the individual, but on whether or not they have been outspoken and advocated for their students and their site. And I hope you take that seriously. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Sheckman. Um, my name is Nat Lowe, I'm an Aptos resident, and I'm here once again to ask you to bring back the CRE contract and renew it. It's been five months since you chose to throw away a two-year investment of public funds and teachers' time and efforts by not renewing the final year of the CRE contract. And for the, for the past five months, members of the community have been tirelessly speaking up and asking you to reconsider. You've heard from the students who spoke here last meeting. You've heard from your own student trustee who speaks on behalf of students in support of bringing back the CRE contract. You've heard from the teachers who wrote you a letter and have spoken up at these meetings in support of the CRE contract. You've heard from parents in support of the CRE contract. You've heard from our local experts in ethnic studies and education from UCSC 
in support of the CRE contract. You've heard from community members in your district who have spoken up in support of the CRE contract. You've heard from Watsonville is in the heart, which has invested heavily in a partnership with PVUSD in support of the CRE contract. And you've heard from over 1,700 individuals and 65 organizations who signed the public petition in support of reinstating the CRE contract. So it's really hard for me to understand what else you might need to hear from, you know, who else you might need to hear from in order to reconsider the hasty and unfortunate decision from last September. As elected boards or elected officials on the school board, your highest responsibility is to serve the students, the teachers, and then finally the community. And you've heard overwhelmingly from all of these people asking you to bring back the CRE contract because that's what's best for the students. And if you refuse to hear all of these voices, especially the voices of your students, then who is it that you're actually serving and why are you here on this board? I'm asking you once again to listen to your students, listen to your teachers, put their best interests first, and bring back the CRE contract so that the students can have the ethnic studies program that they deserve. Thank you. In the spirit of Valentine's Day, I have a kind of sort of love song. Hey there, the school board, what's it like to keep on hearing all of us that came to see we want CRE on the meeting? Yes, we do. That's what five months will do to you. You know it's true. Hey there, the school board, don't you worry about the optics. You can still change your mind just like you've done on other topics. I sympathize. Listen to the students and allies. Be on their side. Oh, bring back CRE. Oh, bring back CRE. Oh, vote for CRE. Oh, vote for CRE. Do it for Bobby. Oh, 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 oh. Please put the CRE on the meeting and vote on the renewal contract. Thank you. Thank you. Next three speakers, Vincent Sanford Carroll, Sean Henry, and Chris Webb. Hello. I'm speaking on behalf of renewing the CRE contract. Uh, I'm Vincent. I go to Aptos High. I'm a junior. I, I took Ethnic Literature Studies 1 my freshman year and Ethnic Literature Studies 2 my this year my junior year, and I, um, I've achieved A pluses in both those classes, which show I adequately comprehend the curriculum that they have. Uh, I've learned nothing but encouraging topics in these classes. It's made me a better person, I would say. I, I think of other people more and what situations they may be in. And it's taught me to be less selfish and less judgmental to people. Uh, it also teaches about the history of the U.S. and its oppression, sadly, the oppression that's happened. And it also teaches, more importantly, about how we can fix this oppression and how we can undo it through positive change throughout our communities. Uh, also, there's uh, allegations that it's anti-Semitic. And uh, in both my years of taking that, I've never, I don't even recall it having anything to be against the Jewish community, and I'm curious to know about how it is. I would like to know how. I believe that's as, as serious as renewing this contract. For I don't. Why should we put down Jewish people? There, if everyone's equal. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Hello, Sean Henry. I'm actually glad to be back here. I spoke in June, and I'm very happy that uh, the there's very efficiently working on the superintendent process. Great to have uh, retiree back, Murray, covering. Um, 
when I spoke last, um, I thought it was probably going to be the last time I'd be speaking here because I uh, kind of threw a little bombshell in there and let people know that I had stage four cancer. Um, I uh, was not looking as good as I am today. Um, but I wanted to speak a little about that for my colleagues as well. Um, 1.9 million people are diagnosed with cancer every year. So basically in the U.S. it's about 1 in 77. And um, my stage 4 cancer was um, pancreatic cancer, and they gave me six to eight months to live. And so uh, yesterday I got to enjoy my son, who's now at Watsonville High School, playing baseball, and it dawned on me that I've already passed eight months. Um, I have a rare form of neuro uh, and doctrine. That's only 2%, about 38,000. Uh, because it was pancreatic, 7%, 2,600. And the doctor said, there's about 151 flavors, kind of like uh, Baskin Robbins. And so there's only about 7 or 18 of me in the U.S. every year. So if I was a class, um, you know, my cognitive impairments and some of the things and the reason why I'm not back working, uh, I'd be one of the worst students that you have to deal with. Um, but the biggest thing, you know, I really wanted to say is among our our staff, we have about 2,400 staff. So that would mean 13 to 14 of our, of our at least our staff members are probably going to get cancer every year. And unfortunately, maybe in our area, about 25 or so of the f their family members. So cancer is just one of the medical things that actually our community faces. And we are blessed to be in an area that has great um, Stanford and a couple different things. And we have PAMP. And I just wanted to, again, thank our union for continuing to make sure that this is a desired place. And I ran into someone on the plane the other day who was flying in from Florida to go to USF and comes here for Stanford. And he was amazed at the care I was getting. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. In light of you know how, how leadership can change, I wanted to just um, lay down a couple things that I think are best practices. And the first one is teacher work days when our union works with the district to have those flexible and like opt-in type things. That's, that's really great and uh, I know my students feel it. Like if I don't do it I've, and I have like a misfire, I I'm, I'm know like, oh, if only I could have you know, taken that time. So that's, that's really great. I hope that, that just continues and through the years, um, teacher work days, optional. Um, the second best practice is related to how we handle electronics. So I've, in my history, I know like when, when the teachers and the admin are working well together to where I can call and have a phone be removed if it has to be, that's, that's great. And like if it has like a, a three-tiered system where, okay, the first time it's like just the period, second time the day, third time we're calling your parents, that kind of system where maybe it even results in a contract if a kid's like addicted or something. Like, I, I think we need to get real serious about that. I don't know if you noticed in the, since the last meeting, the, the Congress has called Big Tech before them again about the seriousness of social media and some of the issues with it. One way I've tried to support school electronics policies is um, with Social Dilemma, that movie, I don't know if you've seen it. There's a good quote, it's on Netflix, um, at the end. And the quote that I, I want to share with, the, with everyone is that um, in, like, s the people who are the true optimists are the, the critics. And I think we need to keep that in mind and not just be quick to dismiss somebody as complaining or anything, but realize that like the people who are really trying to make change in a positive way, they, they may bring up an issue, but if you just ignore issues, they don't, they don't uh, get better. I broke my hand one time. Had I ignored it, I would be crippled in this hand. Instead, I went to therapy and a doctor and a surgery, and it's better now. So thank you. Thanks again. Next three, Evan Jacques Mains, Lourdes Barraza, Maximiliano Barraza. Hello, my name is Evan Jacques Mains, and I am currently in my third course of ethnic studies classes at Aptos High School. Since my first introduction to ethnic studies, I have fallen in love with these classes. They teach a multitude of essential parts to being to becoming a kind and understanding person, but mainly they teach us critical thinking skills. When I heard about the decision to not renew CRE, I was appalled by the ability of the board to make this decision with no evidence to back up the claims of anti-Semitism. I come from a Jewish family and in my two years of taking these classes, I have seen zero, 
instances of anti-Semitism in ethnic studies. It is our rights as students to have access to quality education, so I urge the board to bring the topic of CRE back to the vote and approve it. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Dr. Barraza, and uh, unfortunately, Trustee Flores isn't here today. I'm her constituent. I'm very disappointed that I've had to come a second time because clearly the first time my concerns were ignored. Um, Trustee, I spoke with Trustee Flores yesterday. She told me that she didn't support CRE, the CR, putting the CRE contract back on the agenda because it would cost the district too much money. Uh, and I told her that I would check this, and I did. I reached out to Superintendent Checkman, who made it, you know, who basically told me it's not going to cost any money because there's a grant for it, so that should not be an excuse. Um, so I wonder why she felt the need to lie to me because she was told the same information. I don't know why she lied to me. And uh, I hope that's not how she's representing her constituents by lying to them uh, because that's not okay. So um, you know, I, I hope she looks at the video of this uh, uh, or she's watching it live because I want her to know that when, when constituents are ignored and lied to, um, we will work hard to make sure they're not sitting there because that's not the kind of representation that we want. Um, and I do want to thank those board members that I reached out to that um, took the time to talk to me. I really appreciated that. Some of you didn't respond to me, but those of you that did, I really appreciate that because that is what makes us uh, be engaged in this process. And Trustee DeSorpa, I'm most disappointed in you because I never imagined that you would fall for right-wing uh, talking points, but you did. Uh, you based your decisions on false accusations uh, instead of actual evidence. Uh, true progressive Jewish people saw right through the lies and objected to Newsom's rejection of, the, of Dr. Allison and her colleagues' work. Um, I think you should understand that criticizing the Israeli government doesn't make you, or, or their policies, doesn't make you anti-Semitic, just like criticizing the American government and their policies doesn't make you anti-American. So I hope that you understand the difference in those things. Um, lastly, um, Trustee Acosta, uh, I wonder why, uh, what I wonder most is why you're so afraid to add this back uh, onto the agenda. Is it that you know that you will be voted out? I mean, that you will be outvoted? Or is it that you know that most of the community doesn't agree with you? Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Maximiano Barras Hernandez, and I am a student at Pajaro Valley High School. I am a constituent of Trustee Olivia Flores, who unfortunately isn't here today. It saddens me that this is my second time coming here for the same issue. I thought my voice would be heard and valued by the board, but I was wrong. I thought that if I spoke up, you would understand how important this issue is to me. I thought that since 12 of us came, you would understand how important this issue is to us, your constituents. However, it seems that the two elderly Aptos constituents that came were the ones that mattered instead of us. How does ignoring your constituents encourage us to be involved? My mother told me that Olivia Flores lied to her about CRE costing the district any money, and I am appalled knowing that Trustee Flores is okay with lying to her constituents. I'm wondering why the board is so scared to add this issue back on the agenda. Who or what is behind this fear? I implore you, for the second time, uh, for you to put this item back on the agenda. And this is a message to uh, Trustee Flores, who unfortunately isn't here today, but I want you to know that uh, by the time that you're up for re-election, I will be old enough to vote. And so will my friends. So uh, please keep that in mind, and thank you. All right, next three. Itzel Barasa, Gabriel Barasa, and Alyssa Shook. Hello, my name is Ishan and I live in Area 5. Trustee Flores is supposed to be representing could, my concerns. Hi, could you do me a favor? Could you pull the mic down? Yeah. Thank you, so we could get you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Ishel and I live in Area 5. Trustee Flores is supposed to be representing my concerns because I am her constituent, but she is instead ignoring them. This is my second time coming. I am an 8th grader at Rolling Hills Middle School, and as a future PV High student, I am upset that you decided to ignore me and not add this back to the agenda, as this takes away a great opportunity for me and my classmates. Again, my grade is always the one getting cheated out of everything. It upsets me that when we have a chance at an engaging activity or class, it gets taken away or changed in a way that lessens the enrichment or causes inconvenience rather than enjoyment. Please add this back to the agenda and allow my classmates this opportunity. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gabriel Barraza and I live in Area 5 and Olivia Flores is supposed to be representing us. Uh, the last time I came here, I gave some information about what I thought was a reason why the board decided hastily to remove or to not renew the contract. This time, my message is a lot more simple. I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, I have inherited from my mother a very long memory I remember what people say and what they do and what they don't say and don't do. From my father, I inherited the desire to never to quit until a job is completed. Now you trustees are supposed to be representing the community and doing what's in the best interest of the students. So I have made it my job to make sure that we have trustees that do represent the students and the community that they're serving. And so this is just saying that, you know, that's gonna be my job is to make sure that the people sitting here at the trustees table will represent the needs and the desires of the community. And you've heard that desires of the community is to have the CRE contract renewed so that we can get the ethnic studies that we deserve. Thank you. My name is Alyssa Shook and I'm a first year uh, teacher teaching ethnic literature to honors at Aptos High School. I'm also a local journalist. So I love my job, right? I love teaching ethnic studies because it is representative of who I am as a Hispanic, Native American, and white woman, right? So, and uh, who my students are as members of a multi-ethnic learning community. What I don't love is having the rigorous curriculum and professional development I was promised when I took this job swept from under my feet. Trustees, you failed my students when you tore the rug from under our feet by nixing the CRE contract with no legitimate reasoning or evidence. To quote a student of mine, when we learn to make claims, we learn that we need to back that up with evidence and reasoning. We call those CERs. De Serpa and Acosta, where's your evidence and reasoning? Because of your negligence, our students are getting a watered down version of what they deserve. And that's constantly what they're getting here at PVOSD, a watered down version of what they deserve. If you're not here to serve our students, who are you here to serve? Yourself? You have the chance to make it right, so do it. Come to our classes, bring this to a vote. Do right by our teachers, and above all, do right by our students. Thank you. All right, next three, Noemi Munoz, Bobby Peltz, and Takashi Mizuno. My name is Noemi Munoz, a 17-year-old junior at Aptos High School. I'm here to support the CRE contract, which influences the ethnic studies curriculum that, ha that have taken for two years. From what I understood from the issue is that ethnic studies curriculum is accused of being anti-Jewish because there's more, more focus on the issues that black, Latino, Asian, and Pacific Islanders, indigenous people face than the Jewish. Although it is true that the curriculum doesn't really touch on the topic of Jewish oppression, that is not proof that the curriculum is anti-Semitic. 
By that logic, does that mean that the regular mandatory curriculum is anti-Semitic because it also doesn't really highlight their oppression since that curriculum is Eurocentric? Since I haven't heard that argument being made, that evidence is baseless. This argument in general takes away the whole point of ethnic studies, which strengthens the bond between people of color who share a connection of being oppressed in a society that they all live in, but instead it pits the Jewish minority against other minorities. Ethnic studies is the escapism that many people of color wanted. It is the way out of the sugar-coated history that have been forced to learn where white people never did no wrong and skipped important parts of history where minorities were oppressed. This experience doesn't only apply to blacks and Latinos, but also to Jewish people. All minorities deserve to have a place in ethnic studies, so I suggest to slightly alter the CRE contract to include more Jewish study lessons, but the board members against this contract has no right to take it away. And knowing that as two board members are Jewish, I would like to say one last thing. You as a minority know the oppressions that you face. Now that you have the power to vote, please consider the impact of your decisions on other minorities, even if you don't identify as them. We are all cut from the same cloth. Thank you. Um, good evening, Bobby Pelt, Watsonville High. I'm here once again to speak on the CRE contract. Recently, I asked my students how it made them feel that you have not renewed uh, the contract, and tonight I'd like to use my time to uh, amplify their words. Um, uh, Amelia said, the board always preaches that PVUSD cares and that student voices are always heard. However, there are multiple instances, and in this situation especially, that make ethnic studies students feel unheard. Melissa Beth said, I feel that before deciding not to bring back the CRE contract, the school board should come to our classes and see what is really, ta really taught and not just assume. Mariana said, some families may, may think that taking this class is harmful to students, but they're wrong. Instead, this class will motivate and encourage you to, be, to do better. Angela said, it is without a doubt one of the most interesting and informative classes I've ever taken. Jasmine said, as a student, the only time I have ever felt proud of my background and my culture was once I began learning ethnic studies. Damien said, this class has changed my perspective in every way. It allowed me to find a reason to find an education more than just high school. Julie said, this class has definitely impacted me to become a leader in my community because it's actions like this that force us, the students, to use our voices for better representation. Irene asked, if the entire program can be cut off when a small group of people do not like it, then why, can, why can't it be renewed when the students themselves, the people who teach it, and the creators of the program are asking for it to be brought back. Beatrice says, it is us who want this, and I thought it was us you're supposed to listen to. Alejandro said, this just goes to show how people at the top of the education system do not pay attention to the teachers' and students' feelings. And Miguel summed it up best when he said, they need to be taught about ethnic studies more than we do. I could not have said it any better. Bring the contact back. Thank you. Konbanwa, Nihongo de Harastara, Donani, Rakato Moimas. Oh, good evening. I wish I could speak in Japanese so that I could express my feeling from my heart. But I need to use English to communicate with you. And uh, I have not met uh, Professor Allison in person yet, but I am very much interested in meeting with her and talking with her. And <coughs> one of my best friends is uh, Professor Allison's colleague, and he is a uh, chair of Asian American Studies of Co College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco uh, State University. And uh, I took him and several of my friends uh, including two former Kariho or Cabrillo College faculty. I took them last, last May to see the site where Fermin Tavera was killed. It was near Murphy Crossing Bridge. And one of my friends, uh, you know, is a respected teacher of American Indian literature. He read uh, one of the poems of uh, uh, Jeff Tangami. He's a follow tema of Watsonville High School. He's a Filipino-American poet and educator. And in the process of preparing for that uh, journey, 
I found that one, uh, one paper. In that, I found Miss Ali Parker's great grandfather was the one who found one of the shoes of the suspects, eight, eight high school students from Massonville. They shot and they killed Fermin Tobera in January of 1930. It was in the middle of 1930 race riot in Watsonville. Oh, the time is up. Anyway, <laughs> you need, it's time, the time has come to put this issue on the agenda. Thank Ms. you, Takashi. Akosa, it's your job. Dozo. Last two, uh, Stephanie Pomplin, you wrote public, so I'm assuming you're speaking on 7.1. I'm speaking as a taxpayer who's passionate about bilingual education in Area uh, 5. I just want to clarify what uh, item you're speaking on it, because it's written, it says public. I'm is, just is it under 7.1 open public, public comment? comments okay, so about then. belief in two-way dual language. All right, one second, please. Bill Beecher, you're last but not least as well. Thank you. Okay, Stephanie. <laughs> I've heard that there's local CABE or California Association of Bilingual Teachers meeting um, with concerns about the definitions by the state of one-way, two-way dual language programs and the PBS USD definitions and about how that might limit mixed TACO language students from dual language program entry. But our definitions in the PVUSD district are from the California Department of Ed um, which defines Hyde MSD Freedom Starlights programs as a developmental bilingual program yet. Defined as providing instruction for English learners, utilizing English and a student's native language for literacy and academic instruction. So the program model is designed for students who mark on the federally required home language survey, predominantly Spanish is spoken at home. But sometimes we've accepted in the district enrollment requests from families that are English only or predominantly English, or students enrolled as mixed TACO dominant. However, all of the scientific studies are done with Spanish-only participants in program success. And I'm not aware that the district has ever pulled study on how the success or outcomes academically is for our mixed TACO or English-only students, so I would encourage the district to do that. So I therefore pose these questions out loud. Should anyone recommend a one-way program to home language parents? Um, mixed TACO parents or home language English dominant parents until we gather any data and isn't the best thing for secondary students and their graduation rates the most important points we should consider. So I question um, if the district could consider public notification to all stakeholders about the importance of promoting two-way dual language immersion programs who've been proven statistically to have success long term for students of all late races, inclusive of all home languages and ethnicities. Thank you. Oscar, thank you for letting me be last. The gods have spoken. In a future agenda this school year, it is requested that an item be included to change the district's bylaws regarding agenda participation under BB 9322A. It requests that the agenda committee notify requesters about their decision and if rejected, why. It also requires that the agenda committee accept at least three appropriate requests be accepted in a given school year. Why do this? I've been coming here for over 16 years. I've made numerous requests, written most of them, to have things put on the agenda. People from the public have also come before this board. None of those requests were ever implemented. That de facto is in violation of the Brown Act, the intent for public involvement. You've cut off the, uh, the people. Tonight is a great example of that. You have an obligation to tell these people that all that came up here is verbal requests are not accepted by this board. It has to be done in written. So all of you guys send letters in to the superintendent, which is what is required in this bylaw. The consequences of not doing, implementing, putting this on the agenda 
is I will file a Brown Act violation because I've got 16 years of history that says you don't listen to the people. Secondly, in a future agenda this school year, it's requested that an item be included to study the school structure in five or ten years. With a shortage of teachers and dec declining graduation of new teachers, with declining enrollment and birth rates, with the upcoming closure of schools and the advance of newer t teaching aids and equipment, it's imperative to consider what the school of the future looks like. I have asked for this in the past and been rejected. A study group should be made and done. So with that, thank you very much. There is a written copy for all of you. I followed your rules. And we will now be moving on to item eight, employee organization comments. This is the time that we hear from our employee organizations and each will have five minutes. And we will start uh, with 8.1, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Do we have anyone here from PBFT? <clears throat> Good evening, board, President Acosta, Mr. Sheckman, and Ruby. Um, I want to start off with happy council, well, happy Valentine's Day, happy Counselor's Week. Um, and also uh, just a wonderful month of celebrating uh, the CTE programs that we have here in the district. Um, so as Roddy mentioned, we're at the point of the in the school year in which we are hearing from some of our members who have been non-reelected. And those are really tough, they're really hard conversations. Um, and I, so I don't wanna reiterate all that she said, but basically, you know, it is that lack of support and clear guidance that we have seen most um, prevalent in this year's um, evaluations especially. Um, and especially with, as, as even Mr. Beecher mentioned, we have, we have fewer peeper go people going into credentialing programs. Um, according to the California Department of Ed, there are more than in, in 21, 22 school year, there were more than 10,000 teacher vacancies across the state of California. And that in that year, there was a 16% reduction of new teacher credentials. One of the highest um, areas that we of need is special education and then math and science. Those, um, those are some of the higher needs positions. So when we look at the uh, people that are being not invited back for this following year, and we look at the very unprofessional evaluations they received, um, sometimes not even evaluated properly according to contract, and a lot of times, really, it, it, it is an obvious personality um, difference and not really a, a teacher who is truly struggling with being an academic, you know, guiding a student through academics. Uh, but it is a lack of resources that they have available to them. Um, the supports are so critical, especially when we are in um, a time in education where we see a lot of student behaviors. So safety has been an issue across our dis uh, school sites um, this school year, more than ever. So that's a concern, that the consistency of um, maintaining safe, safe environments um, is, has been a struggle for our sites. But we do look forward to continuing to collaborate with the district and trying to figure out ways to, in, to work with the items, with the people that we have available, with the um, systems that we have in place right now. Because um, we, I know we can't we go back and you know and reinvent the wheel. It's just a lot of work. So what do we have in place right now to help begin problem solving? We do appreciate when the district works with us, when they collaborated with us, partnered with us, and, and allowed they covered the substitutes for the uh, our members that they we were able to send to New York to attend the Center for School Improvement Leadership Institute that was hosted by the United Federation of Teachers in New York City, and that was a CTE theme. Um, we appreciate those types of opportunities. We appreciate the district dis the, um, choosing to partner with us as we bring 40,000 books to the community to give away um, next week, um, and to work with us to 
work on an agenda for activities for that day. Those are the things that we look forward to to build that partnership between labor and um, our employer because it helps us not only highlight what we can do for the what our district does for our students but what we how we as educators are an important aspect um, in the school system when i taught seventh grade science and we taught about keystone species my seventh grade students were able to make a connection of wow teachers are the keystone species in education if you don't have a teacher you have a revolving door of substitutes and you have the potential of a person who isn't credentialed in that subject matter to guide the student in their learning for that school year. You have students. I, I loved hearing from all the students who have come before you tonight to advocate for their educational rights. And it, that's a brave thing to do. That's, they're courageous in standing up and being advocate, advocates for their learning. And I stand with them, the PBFT stands with them, and I really do hope that you will consider bringing back that consult, that con the, the contract. Because part of that contract is for the training of our administrators to understand that program. That's critical. Our, it, that's part of our support system for all the practitioners and, and our support staff. If our administrators don't get it, they don't have that proper training, things fall apart. And we're seeing that in their lack of training for actually doing proper evaluations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, next, uh, 8.2, California School Employee Association. Do we have anyone from CSEA here this evening? It looks like we do not. 8.3, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. Do we have anyone here this evening from PAVAM? <coughs> Good evening, Board President Acosta, Interim Superintendent, Mr. Sheckman, Board of Trustees and Cabinet. I'm Julie Edwards, I'm the PVUSD CTE Coordinator and tonight representing PAVAM with me is Peggy Pugh, our Executive Director of Teaching and Learning. Um, next slide, or here, sorry. Okay, as you will see, the work of PVUSD managers is in our schools, in our classrooms, at the district office and in the community, leading the way in service of our students. You will also see in presentations tonight that our PVUSD managers build and foster the strength and interconnected nature of relationships within the district and positive programs and dynamic curriculum we deliver to our students, resulting from the work of the managers throughout P PVUSD. Later this evening, we look forward to sharing more information about the CTE program and the support managers provide to our site administrators, teachers, and staff to implement these stellar programs in service of our students, families, and community. And lastly, we are extremely grateful to the leadership of our Board of Trustees for recognizing the important work our certificated staff in PVFT and our classified staff in CSEA do each day. We look forward to the Board honoring the collective work of each group, including the Pajaro Valley Association of Managers, as together we collectively and faithfully serve our students, families, and the community you represent in each of your areas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Edwards and Ms. Pugh. Do we have anyone here from Communication Workers of America, CWA? Seeing none, okay. We will move forward to our action items. First action item, 9.1, resolution celebration, celebrating National Career Technical Education Month. This report will be presented by Julie Edwards, our PVUSD Career Technical Education Coordinator. And welcome back. Good evening, Board President Acosta, Interim Superintendent, Mr. Sheckman, Board Trustees. I am Julie Edwards, C a PVUSD CT coordinator, and tonight with Peggy Pugh, our Executive Director of Teaching and Learning, I would like to bring to you um, a resolution for your consideration. Um, February is National CTE Month, which is also celebrated in PVUSD. This month, we honor the PVUSD team supporting our CTE program our highly skilled and dedicated educators, our district team and leaders who contribute to all aspects of providing a program of which we can all be proud. 
This proclamation is brought forward to honor and recognize the richness that is PVUSD CTE, its educators, staff, and students. Whereas the month of February 2024 has been designated National Career Technical Education Month and Whereas more than 3,800 students in PVUSD secondary schools are now participating in career technical education pathways, providing rigorous academic courses and real world experiences that improve the quality of their education and increase engagement, achievement, and high school completion and post secondary transition. And whereas leaders from business and industry here and nationwide report increasing challenges in finding qualified employees for high skill careers in critical and growing CTE related fields, including biotechnology, environmental science, energy, sustainable agriculture, healthcare, business and finance, engineering, and Whereas the board of the PVUSD is committed to educational equity and excellence in our schools to prepare students for living wage careers that support their families and meet the needs of local employers. Whereas PVUSD will continue to support career technical education to advance excellence in education, contribute to the development of a flourishing workforce and improve the quality of life in the city and communities of the Pajaro Valley. I respectfully, I respectfully request your recognition of CTE Month. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, I believe we have two. 9.1, Chris Webb and Sean Henry. Uh, yes, I had the, the pleasure of uh, touring with a group of freshmen, the CTE programming and just overall programs at Watsonville High. And um, I was very impressed uh, with over, not just the CTE stuff, everything was good, but the, the two that were my favorite did happen to be CTE programs. And um, it turns out they're popular with the students as well. And um, like Auto Tech was one of them. And that I, I understand that that's a program where there's, they're basically they don't have enough capacity to meet the, the interest. Um, and so that had me thinking that, you know, at Renaissance, there was a lot of interest in that too. And there actually is a latent auto shop in the back that maybe that would be a good way to, if you happen to go to Renaissance from Watsonville, you could still continue with your um, pathway and maybe you could even enhance it. I just got an email in my school email about this grant for hundreds of thousands of dollars for um, green bussing and gre like, gre like um, EVs basically. And maybe that could be the avenue that happens with the, the Renaissance Auto Shop is that you, you work in some kind of um, <laughs> hybrid technology, electric vehicle technology angle there. There there's also seems like you could use a body shop and that, and if you do the body shop angle, maybe we get into applying the graphic design work that's already at Renaissance and then capitalize on some, CT, some uh, Prop 39 arts money to revitalize that. Also, I'll just note that at the, the last student leadership survey that was done in the fall, the auto shop was one of the top priorities of the students. So there, I feel like there's a good opportunity there and um, that we could really capitalize, we can get money from a number of sources, CTE money, Prop 39 money, um, and then this EV type monies. And also maybe if you do have that, you can support some of your other, um, if we go to like EV buses, you could service them in the evenings, thank you. Hello, this is the item that I really wanted that I came in today to talk about. Um, I, I mentioned very quickly, um, my, uh, I'm very happy that my son transferred to Watsonville High School um, this year in 12th grade. And, um, and I actually have a potential pro project for um, uh, Mr. Patino and some of the kids. Um, so um, my son does a lot of different things and, and uh, is, we're very happy with A through G and everything like that. Um, but one of the things I brought over here is uh, my uh, cousin's actually a master welder and I was going to have some pictures of that. That's actually called a rocket stove um, and it burns very efficiently. 
Um, and that's actually, I, I brought it to Mr. Patino after we kind of, after, well, he made it because I don't, you know, I took some shop classes actually and I had uh, done welding and some different things. Um, but one of the reasons why I wanted to come to speak to this is that while my son was at Salinas High, we did a, uh, I chaperoned a, um, uh, a visit to the East Campus and it's, it's amazing. And one of the first things that came up is when the students were talking, um, I remember th the first student was a welder and he's like, after two years, I will make $60,000. And in this area, you know, our teachers, you know, it's very expensive and that's a starting pay. And when they talked about mechanics, it was like, once we get some certifications, once we get this, it's, it was 60,000, 60,000. And I told the students, uh, in this area, I mean, that's a, you know, that's a great way to start. Um, the need is there, um, the desire is there. And, and one of the things that I really like to pitch to, to the school is that, you know, I took some shop classes when I was in junior high, and I think that really opened up things. And, and we have a lot of at-risk students in junior high that really are already kind of tuning in and tuning out, and before they even get to high school. And I think a trip to open up their eyes about some of the possibilities and then actually having classes where you're, where I commend all of you for actually investing and in going out and getting training people and pooling people. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sean. <laughs> That's nice. And that was the last of our public speakers on this. All right, I will bring it back to the board. Any comments, discussion from the board? Trustee Bolano Scow. I know we're gonna. I know we're gonna have a report on this. So I'll just make a motion. I have a lot of comments and questions, but I'll save them for the agenda item. So happy to support it. Make a motion. Oh, you want to save it for the report and discussion? Yeah, I'll okay. save my stuff anyway. Okay. So I have a motion from you. I'll you second. And I have a second. Trustee Dr. Holm, did you have any comments or questions? I'll I'll, I'll follow my colleague and save them for the report and discussion. Okay. Trustee Deserpa. I fully support. This is great. You've done great work, and we're very happy with the programs. And congratulations to all of the teachers that you've brought in to help teach our kids how to work in the world. It's great. Vice President Serpa. I know it's good to see the tangible results of skills. You know, like Sean's example there. You know, that's the that's the uh, product of you know having the skills and working with your hands. You know, you actually produce a product. And uh, you know, I've, I've been a tradesman all of my life, and it's good to see that you know there's a there's a want, there a desire to get back to that. So thank you. And I, I'm going to pretty much echo most of what I've heard. And it, um, I was we were just sharing on my tour at Watsonville High. My pleasure that it was for me to be able to be our advocate. Um, advocating for continuing support for CTE and got to travel back to DC and speak with our elected leaders back there to continue to support this and so I'm, I'm glad that we have that funding and support as well to help support it. I do believe in the value and the importance of it for a variety of reasons. Um, benefits to students who go to college or even choose not to go to college and I likewise have many family members who have been recipients and benefits of this and, and also from the Pajaro Valley Unified School District and beyond. So um, I'm gonna ask Sylvester to leave the resolution up for a second, but I do have a first and I have a second. So at this time, unless there's any further discussion from the board, I'll go ahead and call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and any opposed? Seeing none, so Superintendent Sec Shechman had offered me to read this um, last paragraph um, which is actually my pleasure to read. So now, therefore, I, Georgia Costa, President of the Board of Pajaro Valley Unified School District in the State of California, on behalf of the PVUSD Board, hereby recognize February 2024 as National Career Technical Education Month and encourage all citizens, businesses, and community organizations to support and engage with the career technical <laughs> education to help prepare students for success in college, career, leadership, and in life for the betterment of our community. This was passed and adopted by the Pajaro Valley Board Unified School District Board of Education on this 14th day of February 2024 by a vote of 502. Thank you, ladies, for your time, and we'll see you again. Don't go anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and moving on to item 9.2, summer school programming for 2024, and this report will be presented by our very own Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education, 
Lisa Aguirre and Heather Gorman and Luis Medino and Michael Berman and Jennifer Little Bruno. Sorry if I didn't get all your titles in there. Please take it away, Lisa. Good evening, President Acosta, Board of Trustees, and Interim Superintendent, Mr. Sheckman. I'm honored to present our comprehensive and collaborative summer programming uh, initiative. The summer programming endeavors are rooted in a commitment to an inclusive and robust education. It is imperative that learning doesn't pause when the school year ends, which is why the PVUSD program will address academic, social, and social emotional needs during the summer months. Collaboration lies at the core of our approach and planning. Staff and I have actively engaged with community partners, local businesses, and all respected departments to create a network of support that extends beyond the classroom walls. Together, we've developed a diverse array of programs that cater to the interests and needs to each and every one of our students. As we move forward, I ask the board to continue supporting these initiatives, recognizing their profound impact on our students' academic success and overall well-being. By investing in comprehensive summer programming, we are investing in the future of our community. Alongside me is the core team who helped plan and develop and get the Summer Robust Program together. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to our Director of Expanded Learning, Ms. Jen Littleton Bruno. Good evening, board. I'm so excited to be here with my colleagues and to share this new idea of summer learning, which I think teachers, students, and families are going to love and benefit from. So what you'll see here is a totally new model of summer learning. And in June, we are proposing to have summer school from June 11th to the 28th, so not taking a break. We normally have a week break, and so we're just gonna jump right into summer school. We hear from our families that child care is a huge concern during that time and that they really need the support during that time. And so during June, we'll offer academics, enrichment, on sites. We hope to offer 18 summer school site locations and in addition to that, two camp locations. So 20 PVUSD school sites open in the month of June. We've never done this as a district and we are super excited to offer this to our families. So students, most students, will be able to be at their own school sites this summer. In July and August, until we start, we are reimagining what summer le learning looks like. And we just um, found out this last week, we got a ESSER summer learning fund, so we have an additional $1,400,000 for summer learning and for a different kind of summer learning. And so we're super excited to be able to support our students in camps, classes. We hope to even be able to, we're working with um, organizations, we hope to be able to send students to DC this summer. So we're really reimagining where learning can happen. And so the month of July, we're gonna lean into our community partners and we're gonna lean into others that do enrichment services so that our students have that time. Summer school will be June, as I spoke about. You'll be able to see the 20 school sites that we hope to open. This is still tentative. I'm working really closely with Hurley and Sergio and the MNO team to be able to ensure that those sites are able to. So the site is still a little fluid. Um, and we will have Watsonville High School open for our high school, one middle school location, and the rest will be TK through sixth grade or fifth grade, depending on the school site. What our summer school day looks like, we're gonna be adding to the instructional day an additional 30 minutes, so it will be a six and a half hour instructional day. The really cool thing about this is that we also allow students to have their breakfast during this day, so sometimes our students arrive late because of busing, students, just so many different things that happen in the morning, and so we work closely with Jeannie and the Nutrition and Food Service team, so our students have 
breakfast 15 minutes after the school day starts. And so we have a huge breakfast program and we're really excited to be able to support families like that. We also, in addition to the six and a half hour instructional day, we do a breakfast club and an after school program. And so students have a minimum of a nine hour day offerings to them to be able to help our working families. And in our continued recognition of the whole child, um, we're really excited about the offerings that we have, um, specifically around the, the rigorous and exploratory and engaging um, realms of academics. We have the STEAM, um, language arts and math. We'll really be focused on those collaborative structures to get students um, wrestling with the, uh, the concepts, but in a way that they're engaged with students. It's collaborative. It's, it's really built around getting kids talking um, and identifying priority standards um, within those content areas. We're gonna be expanding our dual language summer options um, with at the sites that, that are doing our dual language classes. Um, and again, really focusing on the academic discourse. So, so in, all, in all realms, getting students talking and doing the thinking and demonstrating um, their knowledge and, and justifying their thinking. Um, we're also gonna be adding, and it's not on here, um, ELD in middle school and then, and then We'll, you'll hear more from Luis about what we got high school wise for ELD and English. Um, and again, continuing with the whole child, we have the social emotional learning. We're going to be continuing with the zone to grow and being responsive there, and also the restorative circles that more and more teachers are practicing in our classrooms to really build up and support our students. And again, physical education, fitness, and a lot of engagement opportunities. Good evening again, and so you can see why I am going through the process of putting the waiver in with CDE because this is an exciting opportunity, and I love that special education is not siloed in this process in summer school, that we are included, that we are working side by side with our general education peers and having all of these wonderful opportunities, which we didn't always have, and so I think that's really important. So. As I said before, we do serve our students really to look at how do we support them with maintaining goals and making sure that they don't have a learning loss over the summer, but this summer it's gonna be so much more than that and really having that opportunity to join general education programs and even in July the programs that are being offered then. And so I already went over this slide also about the waiver and um, what we're looking forward to and some of the benefits of doing this. So I'm excited about this program this summer. Good afternoon. Yeah, uh, with Migrant Education, we're gonna continue offering summer classes throughout the uh, uh, summer program. Uh, thanks to Jen, we're able to actually actually collaborate with them and be able to actually open up some classes uh, and, and not be supplanting uh, the program. Yeah, we're gonna be having ALMAS, which ALMAS means the Academic of Language, Music, Arts, and Social Studies. We're gonna be incorporating the arts, the music, the social studies within the uh, classes, hoping to find the uh, right uh, staff members that can actually uh, teach the classes. Aside from that, the, uh, um, um, like M Mike just mentioned, the, uh, uh, we're, we've been working with Cabrillo Community College, and the, uh, in the last 40 years, we've been offering a class, a six-week program a Cabrillo for high school students, uh, EL students that the, uh, actually get uh, high school credit. Um, Mike and, uh, and Lisa um, asked in the past the possibility of opening up an additional class um, through Cabrillo. We've been working and meeting this um, the last few weeks and we'll have two classes being offered, two cohorts, uh, combination of migrant students and ELs. Um, and and actually, the, uh, there's a possibility that we might have a third cohort, which will be a math class. And the, um, the uh, positive thing is that the, in the past, migrant had paid for half of the uh, professors at Cabrillo through an MOU. This year, the, uh, they'll pay for 100% of the uh, professors. Our only responsibility will be to pay for the books. Uh, also, for summer school, the, uh, I know that the not all migrant students can attend summer school because of the uh, daycare, the uh, uh, migrant students might have to work. So we're gonna be uh, actually creating a um, digital um, program that students can log in and actually do some work through the uh, computer. And for those students that do not have access to computers or um, internet, we're actually gonna be creating packages that students can pick up at the site uh, or we can actually deliver them to them. 
Uh, the other program that we've been offering is the uh, Boys and Girls in Engineering. That's for middle school students. It's a week for boys and a week for girls. It's, uh, it's, it's a collaboration through Cabrillo as well. A professor actually teaches that class. And uh, it's for middle school. And uh, so the, uh, we're still in the uh, planning stages and hopefully that will come through as well. And I think that's it for our program. These are the themes of the ALMAS program that the students will be engaging in. Um, we also partner with CTE and Expanded Learning's high school program to offer Summer in the City in partnership with the city of Watsonville. And so we're really thrilled for the opportunities this allows for our students. It's a great program. And again, this is in partnership with CTE, and these students get internships over the summer. The success and the feedback we've gotten from the past um, last couple summers has been great. Students really enjoyed this, and it's very engaging. At the high school level, we offer a lot of different types of programs. On the school sites, we offer a credit recovery program. We typically enroll anywhere from five to 700 high school students in our credit recovery in our credit recovery program. We also partner with a lot of enrichment programs. So we partner with Studio um, Judy G, we do field trips, we have, we employ high school students. This is really one of my favorite parts of the summer program is that students can apply to work with PVOSD. There's a job announcement, they apply, they get their work permit, and then they're working in our elementary schools as role models and assisting teachers, helping with snack. It's really a beautiful piece of mentorship that we're able to do during the summer. This is a little bit more information of some of the partnerships that we are now working with. We work with Life Lab for the SAMIAS program, Four Points, the City of Watsonville. Camp Wow is one of our most successful programs. We often we sell them out or buy them out for you know 60 spaces of our students. They go on field trips. It's a lot of activities. Uh, Watson Mill Wetlands Watch does a camp for us. And these are all free to our families. And what a great way, if you are a parent, like me, I'm a parent of four young kids, right? Like, I am so excited that my students are PVOSD students because they get these opportunities. The opportunities that we're gonna offer in July to our families are the same that families are accessing for paid in affluent areas. And so I'm just so excited to give our students not just a summer school program, but summer school and. And our students deserve this. And so these are really, really great opportunities. This is all very, very young. We're meeting with all of these um, folks, but I believe that this is really going to support our families. We will still have opportunities over nine hours a day. So please, if you're worried about any of our migrant families or families that are working, we have the YMCA, we have the ACE program, we have Camp Wow. Those programs run anywhere from nine to 11 hours a day. So we will still have programs for families that are gonna need to drop their students off at 8 a.m. and some of those pick up at 6 p.m. So those opportunities will still be there for our families. The last piece that I wanna make sure that the board is aware of is this is no cost to our general fund. We are utilizing multiple funding sources that Expand and Learning has. So this is ACES, which is our state grant, 21st Century, which is our federal grant. This is the ESSER Summer Learning Relief Funding and also our Expanded Learning Opportunities Funding. And so we're able to really leverage these different funding sources so that we can ensure our students have access to great programming. So we kindly, as a coll collaborative team, ask you to approve this item. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. All right, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for discussion, comments, questions. Trustee Bolano Scow. I just wanna thank everybody on the team for their great work. This is super exciting, it's very impressive, and I think it's something that, it's obviously something that excites our families and our kids. Um, 
and and it's so and it and it's, it's there's a lesson there I think for how we program school because everybody when I hear kids go to summer school they're like this is what regular school should be like and they're like they're having fun they're learning and then we're having problems with attendance and ADA and losing funding so maybe there's a lesson there um, thank you for all your work it's great I'm gonna abstain okay thank you Trustee Blanoscal anyone else Trustee Dr Holm I'm curious about the, the Washington, D.C., you know, aspect of things, because I know a lot of kids, you know, when the D.C. trips for, like, the middle schools mm -hmm. got canceled because yeah. of COVID. You know, so is this an opportunity for kids to participate? We are looking, we are, so Nancy Zuniga, our assistant director of Expanded Learning, is taking on July. And so she is um, working with, let me make sure I'm telling you the correct information. She's looking with Overland and a couple other providers of camps, and we are asking how many spaces, what could we be able to do? And so when we are looking at who we will um, be able to provide these to, we'll likely target a, you know, a specific grade level or grade levels. Mm -hmm. We may look at either students who are participating in summer school or in after school program because our programs focus on the undupl unduplicated students. And so the difference of these programs than when you would typically do them in a middle school would be that these would be free. Right. And so this kind of goes into the same programming that we've done with Science Camp for our fifth grade and our sixth graders sure. at the school sites. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Viserka, did you have any questions or comments? Super fun. Um, when my daughter was a middle schooler all her friends got to go to Washington not all but many of them went to Washington DC and we couldn't afford it right so my kids couldn't go because I couldn't afford it I was a single mom at the time so I think this is really a special opportunity so thank you for putting all of it together um, can you I, I think it was in your presentation but can you come to the mic again and tell me how much because you this 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 set of programming programs mm -hmm. brings in a tremendous amount of money mm -hmm. what is your budget every year for putting all of this after school and summer together our operating budget take a deep breath I know is 36 million dollars it's unbelievable it's it's unbelievable yeah kind of makes me yeah um, so our summer programming goes about seven million and of that money, how much of it do you have to go after and actually seek out the grants as opposed to the money just comes to us automatically because of our population? Okay, so um, give me one moment because I want to give you the correct information. So expanded learning opportunities funding, which is our newest funding to our district, it's about three years old, that one is an entitlement to our district, much like Title I's, Title I funds. And so that comes to our district based on our unduplicated students. It comes to us, however, we will lose it if we do not get our attendance and our enrollment. So we don't have to go over, go after the funds and apply for them. However, we have regulations that we have to meet, attendance that we need to meet, and in, um, enrollment numbers that we need to meet for TK through sixth graders. The ESSER funding that I mentioned, that was um, ESSER summer relief funding. So we applied for that funding in November, and so we were awarded 1,400,000. So we apply for that. That will be likely one-time funding. ACES, we apply every five years for. And 21st Century is a highly competitive grant. So those, we have different cohorts and we have to apply for those regularly. They sunset every three years. That's great. One of the things I love is that these, uh, the complement of programming happens across our district at all campuses, because that wasn't always the case. So the campuses yes. in, in the north part of our district didn't have after school programming. Correct, we actually don't get specific funding for our Aptos school sites, they don't qualify. One of the beautiful things about the new funding, our expanded learning opportunity funds, is if we are meeting our enrollment and our attendance 
for our TK through sixth grade unduplicated students at our Title I school sites, we then are able to offer those services at other schools. So that's how we're able to offer Mar Vista, Rio, Bradley, and Valencia additional programming. It also, once we're able to ensure we're offering those um, across the board, it allows us to offer funding and use it for high school and middle school students as well. That's great. So in addition to being super fun, all of these activities, there is um, an enrichment piece, correct? Like kids are getting some type of academic? Oh, wait, academic piece? Enrichment, yeah. Academic for enrichment? Math and literacy? Yes. Yeah. So um, for summer school, we are partnering just in the back of the classroom with Rich Moran, uh, Mr. Berman. And so we are really looking at and very excited to look at read alouds for our teachers this summer and looking at priority standards and collaborative structures so that it doesn't matter what actual curriculum they're using. They can use books that are for summer school or for the school year. It's the same structures. It's still practicing the same discourse, the same sentence frames. And so for math, we are also working with our math um, director to be able to ensure that we're doing the same thing. He built really great math games last year. And so our teachers got PowerPoints. Our teachers go through training. We actually do one to two days of teacher trainings of our curriculum for summer school. And then they get prep time, and then they're teaching it. That's great. Maybe in the future, because I'll stop asking questions now because I don't want to take up any more time. But maybe in the future you could come back with a report. Because I know um, historically, starting out around middle school, we see some of the achievement scores you know, they had been going historically up, up, up. We see them kind of leveling out or actually going down. Um, maybe we could talk about some of the strategies and programming that we're doing to address that. So you're right. Um, across the nation, once students hit middle school, they start disengaging. And so there's a lot of strategies that we try to employ, and we look at different research-based strategies across the district. One of the things is that we're looking at how we leverage our resources that we have. And so with the expanded learning and the resources that they have, this is the beginning of a partnership on how do we what, um, Board member Melania Scow said, how do we have the regular school day where students are engaged as just as they are in summer school? So you're absolutely correct. And we are looking that and it is through the partnership and coming together with all of our departments throughout the district so that we are serving our students and it's not in silos. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate it. Any other questions or comments from the board? Our student trustee, Libby. Um, I just had one question. Um, so thank you for this presentation. It's so cool and um, everything that you guys are doing. Um, so I know that we have um, amazing partnerships in, at the elementary level. Um, and I was wondering, are there certain like enrichment programs that are only available to certain grades or is there like access to SPNL? So we offer a variety of enrichment programs two different grades. So we have partnerships. So if you are a high school student, you could go to the Digital Nest, Gorilla uh, Gym and Fitness. We have specific ones, UDG, to target different grade levels. And so what we're able to see is where we get a lot of attendance in enrollment. And we're always looking for new partners. So we have you know, high school students that actually recommend uh, different activities they would like to see. Middle school students let us know where they would like to go. And so they vote with their attendance, right? And so we're able to change our partnerships fluidly by doing a site service contract. And so it's always changing. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I just want to thank all of you for the collective work you're doing the, with this and um, for our students. And I think it's very enriching and rewarding. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, ask for a motion. I do not have a motion yet. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. And can I have a second? I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed? Abstain. I was going to get you. Okay. Abstaining? <laughs> Abstaining? Yeah, me. Okay. The vote carries 4012. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got my skull. Okay, moving to item 9.3. This rep um, expanded 
is it expanded or extended? Extended. Extended school year general waiver request. This report will be presented by our Director of Special Services, Heather Gorman. Well, good evening again, uh, President Acosta, Board of Trustees, and Interim S Superintendent, <laughs> Mr. Schechtman. Get that all out in one breath, but I'll say it right this time. So basically, this is um, the public hearing was earlier tonight. And this is the time that you get to decide on whether or not I can move forward and um, present the waiver to CDE. So if you have any questions about that, or hopefully we will just um, pass that on so I can move forward with it and join this exciting team and everything that we're doing for expanded learning. Thank you. And do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we do not. Okay. Um, we already had the um, report and discussion earlier, but is there any continued discussion or questions that anyone has? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Okay, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And the motion, any opposed? Any abstaining? And then the motion carries 5-0-2. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, moving to item 9.4, approve appointment of teacher, a teacher on a provisional internship permit, a PIP. This report will be presented by Brian Saxon, Saxon our interim assistant superintendent of HR. Good evening, President Acosta, Vice President Soto, Board of Trustees, and interim assistant, uh, interim superintendent Murray Shackman. I am the interim assistant superintendent of <laughs> HR. So uh, I'm here tonight to ask for you to approve um, this provisional internship permit for Casey Neely. He's a teacher over at PV High School. He currently is on a short-term staff permit which expires and this will allow him to continue teaching and give him some extended time to get his uh, preliminary credential. So with that, I would ask for your approval. Excuse me, thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, I have just a quick comment. I see that he started as a behavior te behavioral mm -hmm. tech here with us. Um, and so th is, it, is he on a program where he earned his bachelor's and credential? Like through? Through, through our district, like helping out? No, he started as a behavior tech. He worked for us um, last year on this particular step as a ELD teacher and he's now working in getting his degree and teaching credential in physical education. Okay, because I know we do have some pathways. We do. We have a classified grant pathway. pathway. Not anymore? No. Okay, that's all right. We'll, we'll discuss it later. Okay. Yeah, there is a pathway for classified, but we do not have one for like certificated teachers that's to pay bad. for their we credentials. We should probably look at that in the future, but I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, I have a motion. Um, any further discussion from the board? I'll second. Okay, so I have a, um, sorry, a first and a second, and I'm sorry, um, Trustee Bellano Scout. No, no, I'm the second. Oh. second. Okay. I'm third, I'm the third. <laughs> okay, so I have a first, a second, and a third. Um, no further We're discussion. <laughs> no further discussion from the board? Okay, then I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the um, motion carries uh, 502. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and moving on to our next item, 9.5, election of a representative to the CSBA, California School Board Association Delegate Assembly. And this report will be presented by our <coughs> superintendent, Murray Shuckman. You've already elected Kim DeSerpa to be your representative, and this is uh, uh, um, in accordance with the CSBA bylaws. We now want to formalize that appointment. I'd like to ask Ms. DeSerpa to add any comments. Um, um, we've never had a delegate um, hailing from PVUSD and ever, I don't think. And so I was very, um, had a lot of gratitude that I was asked, uh, appointed to this position last year. And so this is just now the formalized election of um, the, the position from PVUSD to the delegation for CSBA. It's super interesting. I went to the 
um, conference last year and I learned quite a lot and brought it back so I'd love to do it again and I just want to add the CSBA has been a very effective organization for all boards I was very pleased that some of our new board members were able to attend their annual conference and one of them came back he I won't say who it was that individual called me from his car with such ideas and enthusiasm so CSBA really does a good job for the board and I'm really happy that um, I assume the board will approve Kim's representation okay and they can vote for two so thank you thank you okay um, any public comment on this uh, none not okay therefore I will bring it back to the board for any further discussion um, I'm curious because there are it, we can vote for up to two, and there's two names on there. And do you know the other person, like uh, Pat Patricia Panini? I'll say that um, we have a, a delegation leader named Roger Schneider, um, hailing from Scotts Valley, and um, he um, recruits delegates. And so if if Patricia's on the ballot, I'm sure she's been carefully vetted already by Roger and her board. Okay. But I don't know her directly. She's on the ballot. Yeah. And yes. We've got, her, we've got her statement. I just was, I, I want, sorry. We have her statement in the board packet. I just wanted to know if you had, okay. Yes, yes, staff has clarified that both names, both Trustee DeSerpa and, I'm sorry, did her pronounce, Patricia are on the ballot and that's what we're being asked to vote for tonight having reviewed both the statements I would like to make a motion to vote for both okay I have a motion from trustee dr. Holm thank you can I have a second yes. thank you I think there's a first and a second there we go we have a first and a second all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay, the motion carries 502. <coughs> Congratulations, Trustee DeSerpa. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. And the next item we will be moving to, uh, I'm sorry, did I not care, say that? 502. Yes, that motion carried 502. Thank you for m catching me. Um, Next item it, we are moving to is 9.6. This is an additional meeting to hold superintendent interviews. This report will be presented by our superintendent, Murray Sheckman. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you, President Acosta. The board made a decision uh, with leadership and associates to interview on Saturday and invite finalists back on Sunday in order to have a board meeting on Sunday. The board needs to approve that. So. This is simply an action, <laughs> an action item to have the board approve a meeting for the 17th of this month. That's the report. Pretty basic. Thank you, Superintendent Sheckman. Uh, do we have any public speakers to this com item? I'm sorry, I was distracted. No. No. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for discussion comments. I'll make a motion to approve our meeting, uh, extra meeting on Sunday for superintendent finalists. I'll second. I have a first and a second. Are there any other questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, I'll move it to um, a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries 5-0-2. Can I add, I want to point out on, because we're on TV and some of you may be interested, on Saturday, we'll start at 8. On Sunday, we'll start at 9. FYI. Yes, thank you for that clarification, Superintendent Sheckman. Um, now we will move to t our report and discussion items. We ha our first is 10.1, Career Technical Education Presentation and Staff Development. This report will be presented by our um, president of PBFT, Nellie Baquetta Boggs and David Patino, our Watsonville High School CTE teacher. Thank you and welcome both. Good evening board, 
Uh, President Acosta, thank you for giving us the opportunity to share out on the great experience that we had in, in New York with um, the AFT's CSI 2024 conference, um, leadership conference with the CTE focus. David Patino was gracious enough to accept the invitation. I'm so thankful I've known David for years. Um, and uh, I do want to add that his brother endured. He endured having my son as one of his math students. So I have a lot of um, gratitude for the Patino family. Um, and uh, um, so I'm going to hand over the mic to him because it, this is really about the practitioners. But one of the things, I, well, I'll add this. The um, AFT partners with the New York Federation every year, and they ha hold this um, leadership institute. And it's really open to um, not only to labor to us as the Federation, but we're, we can invite a trustee and administrators. So we did invite Julie, and she couldn't. Um, it, it conflicted with her schedule. Um, but this is something where there were school districts that the table was their practitioners with um, their labor leader and maybe a trustee and some of the, the administration. Because it's the hope, the objective is for a district to walk away with a plan, you know, the beginnings of a plan. Um, or you know, ways to maybe improve what they have going on. So um, thank you. This is something for the future. This last year when I attended, it was for community schools. Um, so we'll see what this next year holds, and we'll make sure to bring it to you, and, and hopefully we can do this again. Thanks. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board and uh, Superintendent Sheckman. I am David Patino, 14 year old, 14-year uh, employee, CTE teacher with the PVUSD, and I'm a part of family, a family that has served the PVUSD as teachers for over 100 years of service. I have three CTE teaching credentials, and I've taught at three high schools within the PVUSD. All students, all students benefit from CTE, career technical education. On February, uh, excuse me, on January 18th through the 20th, I attend, attended the Center for School Improvement Leadership Institute at the United Federation of Teachers headquarters in New York City. The most important thing I learned on this valued tr tr valuable trip is that PVUSD continues providing CTE pathways within schools, and we have advocated for CTE education throughout the decades. Many other places have gone to separate CTE-only schools or CTE magnet schools. Because of CTE's, uh, PVUSD's commitment to embedded CTE within schools, we serve more students, have broader reach, and create more opportunities for applied learning of knowledge for all of our students. Our first session was the evolution of CTE from a vocational education pathway to what it exists as today. The core takeaway is how the perception of CTE is changing. It can be used to enrich core academics rather than segment, segmenting the core academics. For instance, I, as the construction teacher, partner with a physics teacher to help students build their physics projects, ranging from simple machines to musical instruments. Julie Edwards, PVUSD CTE coordinator, has created the infrastructure to support the entire continuum of CTE support services, which is a best practice. This includes admin support, pathway lead, work-based learning coordinator, CTE counselors, and a college and career coordinator, and of course, the students themselves. At the plenary session, we learned about engaging students in their own future by exposing students to careers early. They can save time and money on their education and career journey and find career fulfillment. We had a showcase from the Brooklyn STEAM Center, which is a magnet high school that eight high schools feed into. These eight high schools have the same bell schedule to allow for transportation. STEAM is science, te technology, engineering, art, and math. They were just focusing on getting students uh, paid work experiences. The juniors start the school in the afternoon and the seniors in, in, uh, attend class in the morning so they can work at paid work-based learning experiences in the afternoon. They have the goal of one parent, parent interaction per month, and the school puts on parent education classes in the evenings and weekends on topics such as real estate financial aid. Their next goal is to co-locate a school inside of a hospital to provide health care workers. I attended a session titled The Effective Communication uh, Builds Collaboration, 
And that focuses on our mission at our own individual high schools. So the Watsonville High School mission statement is Watsonville High School community is, per, uh, is committed to offer rigorous academic and vocational opportunities for multiple career and college pathways beyond graduation. And we, in this session, we verified that our Watsonville High School mission statement is aligned with CT education, CTE education. When, um, when I learned about data-informed decision-making, my takeaway is that the data must be used in a way that is relevant to the stakeholders, and we discussed that data collection must have the students at its center. The next plenary session was stunning to me because I now understand CTE isn't just part of schools, but it can be considered part of society-wide workforce initiative. The following people spoke to us about a new concept called braided funding. Amy Lloyd, Assistant Secretary, Office of Career Education and Adult Education from the U.S. Department of Education. Manny Lamar, Senior Advisor of Workforce Development and U.S. Labor. Scott Jensen, Director of Workforce Strategy, CHIPS Office of the U.S. Department of Commerce. All these departments are working together to reinforce the educational spending and backfill the spending that's going on in education. So sometimes when there's not enough money, they are um, injecting their own funds where work-based uh, more, more uh, labor-based solutions um, can exist. We all know that educational funding is limited, but look, we can look at, th at these different departments because there are many overlapping objectives of these departments. departments. Paid work-based learning experiences should be part of a robust CTE program. This opens up a whole new funding source for strengthening our students' work-based learning experiences. The Assistant Direct Secretary of the Department of Education was talking about Perkins funding and said in a direct quote, unless we say don't do it, dream big. We had another CTE program showcase on food and finance program where they combined culinary skills and entrepreneurship. They learned hospitality, cooking, bookkeeping, and continued to learn examples of um, we continued to learn examples of successful CTE programs, schools, and were showcase, uh, the schools that showcased thousands and thousands of applicants for their programs for only hundreds of spots. They are specialized CTE schools where the curriculum teachers, for example, math and social science, support the main career outcomes of the students rather than vice versa. My biggest takeaway from the School of Art and Design um, was that they emphasized an alumni network. The graduates contribute greatly back to the school through volunteerism and job offerings. They track students for two years after high school, and they are uh, track persistence rates to understand not just who is matriculating into college and careers, but who is understanding uh, who is, but to, to understand the journey after that point, uh, post high school moment. I plan to track my own students who decide to opt in, and I can support them on their post secondary trajectory. While this seems like a large initiative, I believe that it would make the course curriculum stay relevant. Robust CTE programs need to have curriculum refreshes every, sing every several years, and having this immediate and regular feedback from alumni will benefit current and future students. In conclusion, CTE programs should be on-site and site-specific and relevant to the needs of that population. We do this here. We have pathways embedded in all of our high schools. CTE can help students feel welcome and at home with like-minded students and create a sense of belonging and connection for students whose interests fall outside the mainstream, mainstream academia. Finally, I think that we can improve our CTE curriculum by engaging recent graduates from our pathways. I propose an alumni network using the existing CalPADS statewide student ID uh, numbers, ID numbers. Students who choose to opt in would return as an alumni and check in in six month intervals after completing the program. There's a significant value in program graduates returning and sharing their work experience. They could provide feedback regarding program relevancy and in uh, any place to evolve the curriculum to meet workforce needs. It has been my great honor to represent our school district and the state of California in this, a first of its kind, CTE-focused national conference. I thank Nellie Vaccaro-Boggs for inviting me and Mr. Sheckman for authorizing my leave uh, to attend and learn at this national event. I hope the ideas I've shared with you increase student and learning at career outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we do not. All right. Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for comments and discussion. Yes, Trustee DeSerpa. 
That was awesome. Oh, thank you. I'm thank glad you. you got a lot out of the, the conference and the ideas that you just listed out are really cool. I'm wondering if, um, I don't know if you have a copy of what you just presented, but I would love to read it again and take a look at some of the ideas that you brought forward. I can forward that to the board. That'd be my, great. my speech, yes. Thank you. Good job. Thank you're you, Trustee. You're very welcome. Thank you. Trustee, Dr. Holm? Yeah, I, I, I'm echoing what, what she said because I wanted to say, I want to hear those ideas again because it's like just could have, you know, get to absorb them a little bit more because I thought they were fascinating. Uh, the, the ideas I presented are a summary of each successive yeah. session and a summary of each session, how they're pertinent to our um, development and re, um, our robust programs that we offer here in CTE. And I just, I, I, I liked how, just how in, inviting the programs seemed and just how it, it, it seemed to touch on so many areas that students are interested in and just that connection between you know what they're doing here in our district and how that can carry on and I just think about you know how many you know of our programs are you know like the agricultural programs that we have here and you know it's like well, maybe they kind of go on to horticulture at some other location you know but it's but I think about um, just how it ties into so many different areas and it touches on so many things that our students are interested in and you know, where they can be passionate about and just be invested in and, and, and find what they love. Yes, to connect the students with a love of learning through this experiential um, educational process really makes them buy into being part of the workforce and looking forward to waking up and wanting to do whatever that is that they find a connection with and we're connecting our students with that here and i'm so very appreciative that it's it's you know it used to be that you know for so long it was career or college and i love that you know our our modern you know career and technical education is and mm -hmm. i think that's so important so yeah uh, i believe the bre the the on-brand message that we were told to bring back was CTE benefits all students. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Trustee. You're very Dr. welcome. Home. Trustee Bolanos, go. Yeah, I have a few questions. Um, when, if I'm mistaken, you went to middle school at Rolling Hill, um, EA Hall Middle School? EA Hall, South Si Puedes, EA Hall. And did we offer any CTE classes back when you were at middle school? At that point, I do not believe that that was called CTE. It might or have been called something else, classes, but at yeah. middle at the middle school age level, I do not believe that there were those offerings. I believe that at the ROP structure that was existed at that time, we could only engage 10th graders and above. There wasn't a drafting class or what? Oh class. yes, they, they did have a drafting class, which I took. Uh, from Mr. Sultana, they had, um, excuse me, a woodshop class from Mr. Sultana and a drafting class from Mr. Hughes. Yes, I took those classes. Are those classes still offered in, our, in that middle school, in our middle school today? Um, not at EA Hall. EA Hall's woodshop was converted into a fab lab, digital fabrication space, and I do not believe they have a digital drafting, uh, or which would be the evolution of hand drafting. So. Some of us who come from higher ed backgrounds are, are we're in these communities, and from my opinion, there's a devaluing of skilled labor and hand labor, and just knowing our community in Watsonville, we're a very working class and, and a ton of skilled labor, and so I'm, and we also have heard some stats about kids starting to plateau in middle school, and so do you think it would be a good idea to, to bring those, whether or not they were called CTE classes, and, and how does it I, I believe at this point, CTE has become inclusive of middle school programs, and we are pushing down into middle school. I know that one of the delegates who went to the conference with me, Mona Mon, uh, who teaches currently at PV High School, she used to teach um, at Cesar Chavez Middle School. So there has been um, injections of CTE into the middle school level, and the more that we can create those uh, initial introductions to those types of um, skill sets and applied learning experiences, the students may mm -hmm. want to continue their education and it may be a way we convince students not to drop out. I think Thank you. I'd like to add that you're gonna have a district report. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, And so yes. this is a, a perfect, I don't know if it's segue, but uh, yeah. because what 
David got to experience with the union's workshop was really helpful. Thank you. Uh, it was a very powerful experience, and I hope to only uh, contribute to the conversation of a robust learning environment for our students. And the most engagement that we can offer our students will keep them from dropping out, and will keep them in school and be lifelong learners and uh, lifelong earners. Thank you, Trustee Blanosco. Vice President Soto. Thanks, David, for the information. That's that's good stuff. Um, my, I just have a question in regards to uh, employment. Do you have a percentage or an idea of how many uh, students are direct hires out of out of high school? You know, with with some type of uh, training or skill. If you have a rough estimate. Uh, I do not have a rough estimate, and that's why I noticed immediately that we have a blind spot. And my, in my opinion, the School of Art and Design in New York, they do not have that blind spot because they have a two-year tracking program. That two-year tracking program could be invaluable to us as we look at our data to validate our programs and find those numbers for exactly what is happening. Uh, for instance, I just, just did an experiential thing, uh, at the bank, Earlier this week, I ran into one of my former students from two years ago, Rogelio. He's finally enrolled in a pre-apprenticeship program with CET, which is a construction, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a statewide construction training program. So he's just finished his pre-apprenticeship and he's ready to start his actual apprenticeship. I asked him if he would want to present, uh, you know, be a guest speaker in my class, he agreed. And we need this data. I believe that that is a robust way for us to maintain the validity of our programs and make sure that we're uh, getting student skills that are relevant. And then I could easily answer that type of question. And, and part of the reason why I'm asking is, um, I know a lot of contractors in the area, you know, being, being in, the, in the business, um, and you talk to them and they're always talking about, I can't find guys to work, I can't find, you know, I can't find good guys or people that know you know something or, or even want to work for that matter so that's what I'm saying that if this could be an avenue for them to uh, get into our workforce here locally if they can read a tape measure and have some simple tool identification and get on the job and get going I agree with the need to connect the work f the work labor force uh, the employers with the students and the students who are old enough, you know, 18 years old in, in uh, graduates of our programs. And I would love to see a better connection as we are launching them. A lot of my students, uh, former students, excuse me, return to me and they're confused about their class offerings at Cabrillo. And then I try to connect them with the Cabrillo counselors or with different apprenticeship programs or pre-apprenticeship programs. Um, this is something that I do because I feel it's important to our community and our workforce here but I don't think it's something that we really have um, a good mechanism for, and I would love to see it developed more. Yeah, that would be good, but yeah, good job, keep it up. Thank you. Trustee Just, just a quick yeah. add on that. I hear that uh, some of the admin at PV High is interested in doing a CTE career fair and bringing employers to the high school there, so just an idea, hope that comes to fruition. Thank you, thank you Vice President Soto, and thank you Trustee Bilano Scal. Um, David, I'm just going to add, I want to start with thanking you for actually going to the conference because that was also your sacrifice of your time, giving up time with your family to make the trip and travel. So thank you. We're appreciative of that and all you've brought back to the district and to your students, our community. Um, I also want to thank you for inviting us in and allowing us to come into your classroom and getting to see your students work um, with their models for the tiny home and everything they're doing there. It was just, that was really an awesome um, time and your students' interaction with us in their conversations. And we could just really see the active engagement in that classroom. Um, also speaking to the continuation, you, we from there went down a couple of doors to the old machine shop, which is now a storage unit. Yes. Sadly. But we, um, Superintendent Schechtman and I, had also conversations with your principal, Principal Gregorio, about getting that up and running. And I think that's another added part to also continue to look to, to do that because we had this conversation. Now that equipment in there is still relevant. 
the um, yes, I agree. It's still relevant, and I taught in that room for four years, and I am looking forward to bringing that space back online for uh, whatever teacher we're hiring. I believe it is for the uh, engineering, um, the engineering pathway that's um, mm -hmm. that uh, Julie is bringing to uh, Watsonville High School. So, uh, very exciting space. Yes, it is, and it's sad to be seeing what it's being used for right now. But we're working on it. We're getting there. Yes. So. Thank you again, David, and thank you for coming and staying with us. Sorry it got to be so late, but I think this was an important presentation and for all of us to be able to hear. And again, thank you for inviting us into your classroom. It was a pleasure. You are always welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And Nellie. And Nana. And Nana. No, she wasn't here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and yes. Okay, moving to item, yes. 10.2, the 2324 CTE. If nobody knows what that means yet tonight, that's Career Technical <laughs> Education Program Update. This report will be presented by our very own PBUSD Career Technical Education Coordinator, Ms. Julie Edwards. Good evening, Board President Acosta, Interim Superintendent, Mr. Sheckman, Board Trustees, and Cabinet. I'm Julie Edwards, um, PBUSD CT Coordinator, and tonight I'm excited and happy to bring on Valentine's Day um, some really good news from the CTE program. And I'm going to start a timer so I don't go too long, which is what I'm doing now. There it goes. Um, so over the last, since 2019, when the district brought the CTE program back under our own leadership. We've gone through a, a, pretty ex a, a pretty extensive, deep and wide process of understanding our program, where the needs were, what the market needs are, and what the CTE in the, in the U.S., as David um, referred to, has transformed and evolved over time, and how we could take our program and um, get in alignment with that. So. Um, would I, without further ado, we'll just dive right in. So we aspired to create a program that's really reflective of our community, of the needs of our community, and that serves our students at the center. We, we came up with our theory of action because our CT program ha didn't have a vision or a particular focus or, purf uh, or purpose, and I'm not going to read this, but I will emphasize that we um, set out to address inequities and affirm the strengths and resilience of our students, families, and community to empower and resource them to realize their aspirations um, and mitigate the impact of disproportionate consequences that um, befall communities like PBUSD. So to do that, we came up with a vision and a mission for our program, and in the packet that I gave you, um, there's uh, documents around that, so you will have that. And we've I would say successfully made the transition from vocational education as we used to know it um, to today's CTE with A through G pathways. All of our courses are now um, able to be reflected on a college application if the student earns a C or better. And therefore, we've opened the doors with all of our CTE programs to college, four year, two year transfer, two year technical training, and straight to the workforce. So. It isn't, we do not presume to make decisions on behalf of our students. We, we lay the table and help them understand what their options are, what they look like, with the different choices that they would make, and we make sure that the courses that they have give them all of those choices. We have quality programs now. Super proud to feel like I can say that with confidence. We have amazing teachers. Many are strategically placed so they can teach in multiple pathways because they're multi-talented people. And um, our staff development in our CTE teacher community of practice is very much goal aligned. So we have, um, over the last, like I said, four and a half years, gone from something that was uh, pretty undefinable to something that's pretty tight in terms of our direction. Um, so w inspiring us are the 3,800 students that are currently enrolled in our program. We have 48 teachers. Currently have, we have 78 A through G courses. 
that cover 26 pathways. And I've dropped a few hearts in the slide deck because it's Valentine's Day. Um, but 70% of our high school students are currently in a CTE pathway. So that's like, that blew my mind when I calculated that. Um, our program in PVUSD represents 14 of the 15 California industries that have been identified by the state. And um, we, are have, we have CTE programming at six high schools. Um, 15 honors courses and courses that are articulated with Cabrillo College, which means that our students are earning concurrent college credit should they get a B or better and with their teacher's recommendation. So um, in all of those concurrent college credit courses also get the UCCSU honors bump on the transcript. So students are getting the same kind of a bump as a student in an AP course that earns the same type of a grade. Um, as of this year, we have four dual enrollment classes with Cabrillo College, which means our students are enrolled in a college class where they are um, in a like a full section of, of high school students. So it's not one high school student in a sea of adults, it's you know 25 students taking American Sign Language or they're taking medical terminology and getting a jump start on their prerequisites because they're headed into a health career, things like that. And since we started tracking our students, 428 students um, is a, uh, completed a pathway, meaning they took two courses in the same pathway, and that's a 12% increase from the prior year. Um, this board heard about the seal of civic engagement. In the past, we're, we're folding the seal of civic engagement into CTE pathways as part of a focus area to help our students become community ready. So, and their projects that they do in their CTE classes can be organized around their achievement of the seal of civic engagement. Um, this is the constellation of partners. There are more than this, but we have lots of amazing partners. These are destinations for field trips. These, these individuals serve on our advisory, which I'll talk about in a moment. And um, they provide a lot of support to our program. So I just wanted to show you that that's a growing um, swath of different organizations across different industries. Um, our CTE advisory is, is something that we are required to have, and it's amazing. This year, we finished a cycle where our 40 plus advisors um, that include teachers, staff, different um, district departments, board trustees, parents, and professionals from industry, higher ed in the community, meet three times a year to look at the data from the program and make sure that our program is aligning with the high quality jobs in a five county region, not too far from home. And they provide feedback and direction to us as we um, form our program. So this next slide just gives you an idea of the organizations that those who serve on our advisory are from. We are required to have one advisor from each industry in this th of that we have a pathway in. Um, and so that's a, that gives you an array of who those individuals are. And then this is a super interesting slide. I wanted to share this with you because this is something that the advisory engaged with. You can see on the left, um, there's a little green arrow next to $54,986. That is considered to be a wor one working adult with no children. That is the living annual income required for the um, five county region that we live in. And so I wanted to point that out because as we look at pathways for our students and building pathways, we wanna be sure that all of the pathways we offer are, are leading to a living wage um, quality career. Whether the student goes straight into the workforce or whether they go to four-year college or Cabrillo and transfer, um, that is kind of our, our metric. And then on the right, those, that data is also from our region and all the little green check marks are where we have a pathway where it meets or exceeds um, the, the uh, one adult, zero children sort of threshold. So you can see that we have a broad range of, um, of career pathways in those coming right out. Um, uh, sorry, didn't have dinner, so my little, so 
anyway, that is, this is the kind of data that the advisory engages with, and we dive deep into occupational labor market data, and this was an, a summary I wanted to share with the board because it is the kind of thing that um, guides the work of the, the um, direction of the program. And so the, and this will be in your packets as well, but our, our advisory shares feedback. They give affirmations, like w they let us know, okay, we're, you're doing this well. This looks good. This is in alignment. They give feedback um, to, for improvement ideas, and they also provide some recommendations. So this, this will also be, um, like I said, it, you've got access to that information. This is the other slide that I'm super, was super excited to share with you. One of the things that's happening in the United States, and in particular in the state of California right now, is that CTE funding is robust. The, the state of California knows that it needs a skilled workforce, and they're putting money behind that. And you can see down the left, those are different sources of money. Those are grant areas. The, the colored boxes across the top, healthcare, engineering, computing, education, and climate and STEM, the, the, the latest large sources of grant funding for CTE are centering on those industries. They are requiring that the pathways that we apply for funding for fall within those categories. And um, I wanted to show you what's coming up. The K-16 Collaborative is a large regional grant from Santa Cruz County down through Ventura County. Um, the Central Coast Region, which we are a part of, received an $18 million award and we will be applying as a K-12 district within that region for a portion of that. We actually have a program that is in a good enough shape to um, apply for cycle one funding, and I think we're the only K-12 in Santa Cruz County that is eligible to apply based on the metrics that are part of that criteria. So we will apply that, uh, those gr deadlines are coming up. The Golden State Pathways Program is from the Ca uh, California Department of Ed. It's a $500 million pot, uh, one-time money. We will be applying for that for multiple pathways. And something that somebody mentioned earlier, one of the pathways that we are going to apply for um, implementation and planning dollars for is the auto shop at Watsonville High School to renovate it and to bring it into a hybrid environment where it has electric vehicles as well as combustion. And so, and I've been working with the teacher and we're looking forward to um, getting, hopefully accessing that funding because it will be an expensive um, transformation, but a really exciting one that our students deserve. Um, there are other pathways that we're focusing on. Health um, careers is a big focus. And you can see all across the board, um, the the areas that that the career uh, the dollars that are coming from the state are centered around some really exciting things for kids so we're we're looking forward to that so you can see then our strong workforce was a 28 million dollar pot this year in the bay area we got um, awarded a six hundred thousand dollars that supports the college and career specialists in our college and career centers that are Cabrillo employees that are supporting our students with their applications and with um, getting enrolled in the dual enrollment courses, so that's funding that work, which is for all students in high school. And then there's the this the CTIG, is what its na its long name is Career Technical Education Incentive Grant. We got an eight hundred forty two thousand dollar award for that. That was just about a month ago. And then we have an annual award for Perkins, which is um, this year it keeps going up a little every year because as our program gets better and our data that they require us to provide, it shows improvement, they inch that dollar amount up every year. And then California Serves is a grant we're going to apply for. It's a 500,000, or it's a, it's a $5 million pot, but it's $500,000 over two years to support the implementation of the state seal of civic engagement. So super stoked about that. Um, so we're living in a time where CTE is being highly valued um, across the country and in particular in California. And so we are really excited to, you know, apply for those dollars, work hard on those applications, and um, then just wait for the results and hope that we uh, achieve the, the goals that we have for our program and the funding that will support it. So t as far as our schools go, and I'm going to check my time really quick here. Um, okay, that was it. 
Um, okay. Uh, that was 13 minutes. So just very quickly, I'm just going to page through these. This is at a glance each school. So Aptos High with the pathways, the highlights and partnerships. PV High, similar number of pathways. Two new pathways at PV High this year. Um, uh, public and community health and web and social media programming and design will be in the fall. Adding to PV High, Aptos High has a new engineering pathway, I think as David mentioned, and we're going to be scaling that to Watsonville High in the fall. Um, this is Watsonville High, 19 pathways, six California Partnership Academies that all have a CTE pathway running through them, and they're building tiny homes, as is Aptos High, in the Building and Construction Trades program, which is a really exciting program. New School, amazing. You heard the music earlier tonight. The um, Entrepreneurship Music Production and Recording Arts course is going gangbusters, and the students love it, and the teacher's incredible, and the partnership with El Sistema is um, just really enriching every aspect of that implementation, and we're delighted to have a authentic CTE pathway at New School. And then Renaissance has three pathways that work together. There's an ag pathway, um, graphic design, and product innovation and design, and um, incredible educators there as well, and um, with honors and um, articulated credit for the students at Renaissance too. And in summary, 3,800 students, 26 pathways, 100% A through G, and building skills, empowering futures. That's what we're about. Wow. Yeah. 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 I think that does deserve a round of applause. Thank you. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. All right. Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, discussion. Uh, Trustee Dr. Holm, if you would help us out, how's that? Thank you very much for that <laughs> presentation. It's just, again, doing, seeing these pathways is just so exciting. And Thank like you what so I much. said to Mr. Fatina, it's just like, Delightful. Yeah, I'm curious about some of the skills like that we're because I know we there's the careers that the ones that are specific to various careers. Mm -hmm. But I know, you know, working in a CTE you know career pathway for Cabrillo, oftentimes our students struggle with some of the career skills, like the basic ones like resumes, interview skills, like writing cover letters, like the mm -hmm. ones to actually they can do the job, but the skills to acquire the job are sometimes a challenge. Does, you know, how does our, how do our CTE pathways support the job acquisition skills or the career acquisition skills? Um, that's a great question, thank you. Um, I like to say that CTE is a way to, it's a vehicle by which to teach the things we need to know about work and the world of work by virtue of whatever that topic area is and the student May, that may be their their um, passion and what they decide they want to do, but if it isn't, they've learned to um, acquire a level of competency that, that hopefully gives them self-efficacy, and at the same time, they've had the chance to acquire soft skills, which we call, we've been calling human skills, but that has been the primary focus of our community of practice, is how do we teach and coach the kinds of skills that are predominantly required and needed to be successful in the workplace. So initiative, integrity, critical thinking, being a good team player, having to have a difficult conversation, conflict management, even those kinds of things. So we're working in our community of practice with teachers and collaborating around how does that happen in a project-based environment. And the answer is it's, it's a perfect environment for that because it just generates all of those um, needs to interact for, uh, fr uh, from a human standpoint. And as far as the, um, the kind of core career documents, resume, letter of introduction, those kinds of things, um, those are part of a student portfolio and it's one aspect of our program that we are continuing to invest in. We have a CTE counselor who is full-time and she does resume workshops. She will work with students. She'll sit with them one-on-one. -on -one. But one of the things that we're building into our program, we have a, a platform we've built on top of a really 
incredible piece of technology, Salesforce, and we've, we're building a resume tool into that, and every student has access throughout high school. So it is a generator, a, a resume generator, much like um, it's modeled after a LinkedIn environment, but it's a safe environment. And um, so the answer is yes, we are doing that, and we'll be doing more and better. And um, yeah, we, that's, thank you. That was a great question. Thank you. And just point of order, I noticed that it's, it's 1013, so I just wanted to, you know, make a, a, a motion just because I know we have a presentation after this. I just want to move to extend the meeting to 1130 just to be on the safe side. A second. Okay, I have a motion to, in, in a second, to extend the meeting to 1130. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We don't get a vote on it. Okay, <laughs> the motion carries by zero two. And that, thank you, that's, that's just my comment. And, and that's it, Trustee Dr. Holm. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Bellano scout yeah, th thank you for this presentation. There's a lot of <laughs> great things happening. Uh, Powder Valley High School, a school I'm close to, and if I'm understanding this correctly, mm -hmm. we have, a, and I forgot to compliment him, but David Patino is obviously one of the best teachers in the district, and he's really resonating, so many kids are resonating with his class. We, I don't think we offer a construction class or a trades class at PV High, am I mistaken? No, you're not mistaken. Is there a plan to, enter to give the 14, 1,500 kids at that campus a similar opportunity, if not quite as good as the one Watsonville High is getting, the, cla the chance to learn trades work? There are a number of pathways at PV High. If you look at that list, there's incredible teachers and incredible programs going on at PV High right now. A building and construction trades program is a facilities um, endeavor in terms of you know there the f a facility would have to be built for that um, but you know I mean I hear you and um, one of the things that we've entertained over time has been if there was a way to move students around for certain to access certain programs and that's something that we're still thinking about how that could work um, so the answer is PV High has amazing pathways their entrepreneurship pathway is incredible and the the programming and all the you know the arts that are there there it's a great there's well, great offerings but like I, Vicky, I no thank you and yeah I mean this is it's not just my opinion it's what mm -hmm. I'm hearing um, and just in terms of we have uh, many kids have that skill set or that talent but if we don't offer them the opportunity to explore it and learn in a classroom then I feel that we're doing we're doing a disservice to those kids I hear what you're saying, we have other pathways. It gets to a second question, we've had this question about uh, verb, uh, Superintendent Sheckman taught me, consistification. Every and there's different things happening at different high schools, and I'm not necessarily being critical, but if it's not always, if we don't have certain things the same, how, how, is, how, is that, how are you taking that into your thinking? I'm like, okay, we have this at Watsonville High, we have this at Aptos, it's not some things there. How, how, are you, how are you planning around that? Or is it just a matter of grant funding? Or Actually, um, so what we do is when they first go in, we look at what is in the local environment and the facilities. So it, uh, a great CTE program takes a lot of money. So one of the things that, and it happens more often for our secondary students, are called intra-district transfers. So if I'm a student where I'm zoned to go to Pajaro Valley High School, but I'm really interested in being going to the construction and trades, building a tiny home, I can apply for an intra to go to Watsonville High or Aptos High they have it there as well, and say the reason why I want that intra-district transfer. And so by, if we had the, con the great CTE programs at every single school site, it would take up too much money and resources and it would be watered down. So if we put and build up great CTE programs specialized at our high schools, then they can be state of the art where our, our students are getting the best. And so that was the, the thinking that we have in building the CTE programs. And, and is there, are there certain core programs, pathways that you're say are, that, we've, that you've agreed on are the top priorities that all of our kids should have access to throughout the district? Is that? I would say that uh, confidently that each school has a core of pathways that all stu students deserve, for sure. But as Ms. Garia said, um, it's, near on impossible to fund and manage 
replicate everything everywhere, but we, c we make sure that there's high value, high interest pathways at all schools. And then knowing that, um, as she mentioned, students can, can move around, so. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, next question would be about middle schools. Mm -hmm. um, we heard from our esteemed teacher, and we all know that there was very cool, and uh, those of us fr from the older generation, I say that as one of the youngest member on the board, had <laughs> workshop, work, wood shop classes, auto shop classes, and middle school um, as a way to get, and this is as an arts and music teacher, this is for those who don't, who thinks art music is just some novel thing, actually we're connecting with a bunch of kids who actually get excited to come to school and will actually keep up their GPA to do arts and music, or some people it's football and sports. So I'm also wondering similarly about these kind of CTE hands-on classes wouldn't it be great to bring them back to our middle schools to get, because we we're having is getting kids excited about something there to go to high school and keeping up their ADA and all those wonderful things that we had at EA Hall when Superintendent Sheffin was principal there. So just, is there any discussion about bringing more of these classes to our middle schools? Um, I would say that middle school um, electives may or may not be CTE, but they may look, resemble that, and some of our schools do have some classes like that that are not CTE specific, but that are electives where it's programming class or, or something like an invention-based class. We have a invention-based um, programming class at Hall District right now. So definitely it's, c you know, CTE or CTE-like is something that um, is happening. Thank you. I just my last comment and kind of point in, in thinking about the newer generation, many of whom are not going to college because they don't think it's financially worth it or of the economy right now. But many of us are actually, many of us people are have multiple gifts. And I think we've been taught you can only do one career and that's all you're going to do. Some of us have multiple jobs, multiple gifts. And, and that's when some of our students and my peers, we talk about that, being able to do a variety of things is, is while challenging from a, the way this country treats benefits, um, is actually very rewarding and liberating. So I just think we might want to bring that into our thinking about, you know, career path where it's like, well, this person's just going to do one thing their whole life, and that is the old school way of thinking, but now that is changing rapidly. And many of us, and one of the best things about our country is that many of us are self-employed and are, are finding ways to do multiple things. So I just hope that we can bring that into our thinking. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Trustee Belarusco. Anyone else? Yeah. Trustee Caserpa. Your mic. You put up a slide that had, um, so maybe you could go through them real quick. It was about the government identifying like uh, those high paid. Oh, this one. one before this one. That one? Or yeah. Well, this is local labor market I'd in different. One after this, maybe. So it's probably that one. No, it's not that one. That's all the grants. Anyway, the point I wanted to make is that we had, um, before Dr. Rodriguez came to the district, we had uh, some pathways that didn't really lead to high paying jobs. Right. So you mentioned that California has earmarked. 14 or something, for, or maybe 16 um, high paying pathways that will culminate in a high paying job. If, well, if California has a structure with 15 industry sectors, and there are jobs within each of those sectors the, from the low paying all the way up to high paying. So we just happen to have a program yeah. where we have. 14 of those sectors are represented in our program. 14 that's of the I 15. Focus on. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's very cool. Yeah, it's a lot and of breadth. And it's a change actually from past practice. Uh -huh. We are actually focusing on pathways that do lead to high paying jobs. Yeah, it, our grants require us to. It's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Trustee DeServa. Vice President Soto. Yeah, once again, speaking from my construction background, well, this is good to see, especially for the industry, because you know, I was in it at a time when the bottom kind of fell out and I had to switch gears, and now the, the bottom's back on, and 
things are looking good. And if you look around our area just in general, I mean, look at what's going on with Highway 1. I mean, that's construction work, what they recently did on Freedom Boulevard you know, with the water system that's being put in, you know, from Houlihan out to Paro River. So there's a lot of major infrastructure going on. So that's just an indication that, you know, that development's going to follow. Those are the precursors to developing a, an area. We need those infrastructure pieces for homes and shopping centers and things to function. So I think there's a wave coming and the trades are going to be uh, a big, uh, they're going to be in demand. So that's good to see that you know, the kids are getting involved with this and, and we need that labor force. Yep. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Vice President Soto. Julie, could you go back, I think, also for the, you had a slide like with the community partners and those This one or the, the one like that? Yeah, like that. Okay. That decline. And, and that is a lot. And so, you know, I commend you and your team. That's, that's good work. I mean, because none of us in this community, we're not, a, you know, in a silo. We're not an island unto ourselves, right? And, um, and I'm also seeing some of the ones, right, where um, a lot of my students, right, feed into Watsonville High School and the engineering and technology and the airspace grabbed also my attention. And I'm seeing the Watsonville Municipal Airport up there and Superintendent Sheckland. And I just recently listened to a very wonderful presentation by the director of the Watsonville Airport, um, Raylon Williams. So I'm just really glad to see the collaboration you're doing, right, with the whole community as a whole. Yeah, and I don't know students. if Rayvon mentioned or not, but um, for the last two years we've had, e you know, upwards of five or 600 of our fourth graders spend a day at the airport, and we just booked the next five schools um, to go this spring to spend a day at the airport. He, so. did, he did speak to that. Yeah. And then the program for the youth of the certain ages, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. so thank you for that and for a great presentation. And um, thanks. Yeah, it was a thank great presentation. You. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank President you very much. The CTE board meeting. Yeah. President <laughs> Acosta, I have one more comment, Julie. Yes, sure. Um, I've spent some time with the trades in Castorville at their training center, mm -hmm. and are we partnered with them in any shape, form, or fashion? We have conversations with them. They are typically 18 and older, but w we uh, we make sure that our students in the, in the programs that are related to the trades know about okay, those opportunities. Okay, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity there for partner partnering with them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. If we could, yeah, and for example, the California Home Building Foundation is a, a like a legit partner. They we have a contractual, non-monetary relationship, but they provide all of our our um, construction students with the OSHA certification. They pay for it for our kids to to earn that certification every year. We would we would get a grant to do that, but they're they're providing it, and we're looking at those kinds of relationships with other organizations too. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Serpent. Thank you again, Julie. Moving on to item 10.3, Adult Education Annual Report. This report will be presented by our Director of Watsonville Aptos Santa Cruz Adult Education, Dr. Nancy Vilicic. Welcome. Well, President Acosta, Vice President Soto, Trustees, Interim Superintendent Sheckman, Cabinet, we are great and grateful to be here tonight to present um, all about our school. And we started with the first slide, which is our leadership team. And the Assistant Director, Eric Saavedra, I don't know that you've had an opportunity to meet him. Where are you? Oh, right here. Right here. And um, I wanted him to be part of this uh, presentation, to, or at least be here, so you would see who he is. Now, our department chairs are really important in our school. We meet with them at least once a month. We talk to them probably once a week to find out what the needs are in the school. And the office manager, she is incredible. We couldn't do things without her. And then we have a community advisory council president. That's um, Susan Bucci. And Susan was going to come tonight, but she couldn't quite make it, but that's all right. She'll be here next week at our community advisory meeting that we're having. So if we go on to our theme, this year we had um, a school theme. And Maria Elena de la Garza came and did a presentation for us. She's the director of CAB. 
She did a presentation on August 10th, and we kind of talked about the butterfly effect and how your life matters. You know, sometimes when the staff is there, they think about the students all the time, but what about their worth and what about them and how they make a difference every day? And that living a life of permanent purpose, everything matters. And to de deciding to do something different will make a difference. So y it kind of put people in a great mood because they started to feel how everything they did mattered and that we're all one of a kind and that we have the power to change the world. And in our world, we can make changes for our students and all kinds of things like that. Um, it's really, really a powerful um, tool as a teacher with your students. So our agenda, I kind of went over, this is what we're gonna talk about, the background history, the governance. This is just an overview. And so let's go on to the background. So 1928, I wasn't quite born then, but uh, that's when they started the school as an evening high school, and that's what it was. And basically for immigrants, um, Croatians were here, the Portuguese, the Italian, Japanese, Chinese, Filipinos, Latinx, Hispanic. We've had probably s more nationalities than any community, and they've evolved over the years. Well, in 1998, the adult school was feeling really great because we made a final payment on Radcliffe School, and that was our adult school. But then, in 1999, the district came and said, hey, we need the elementary school back. So we'll give you $800,000 and we're taking the school. And they did, and we went to the Porter Building. And then we planned to uh, purchase the downtown center, which is the Watsonville Downtown Center. It was an old um, bread store, Langendorf bread store. Then SEBA came, and when SEBA got here, and they said, you know what, you need to give up your school because we need a place to put them. So they put them in the Watsonville Downtown Center and we shared part of Cabrillo's uh, facilities for a couple of years. And then they said, well, we'd like to do it another year. And I said, no, our staff's had enough. We need to go back. So we got back and then in 2015, Santa Cruz decided they wanted to merge with us because they wanted to keep an adult school and, and, and so we have the adult school in the county, really. Um, so they merged with us and we have a new name. We were Watsonville Aptos and we added the name Santa Cruz. And thus we have Watsonville Aptos Santa Cruz Adult Education, our long Waske name. And the three major sites are right here at the district office on the other end, Green Valley Center. The Santa Cruz Center is on La Fonda, and then the Watsonville Downtown Center is the old Langendorf building. We've had uh, numerous additional sites throughout. Um, sometimes we'll go to um, New Brighton, we might go to Live Oak, we might go to a school in our community, Starlight or Ohlone. We go to different, various sites. Sometimes we go out to um, like Lakeside Organic, may say we want you to come and offer um, English classes to our students, so then we'll go there. You know, wherever the demand is, we try to meet it. And then COVID hit, and what was gonna happen to the adult school with COVID? Well, our teachers really did a fantastic job because they had to pivot to online instruction. And you have to remember that adult schools, students don't have to come. We have to make it inviting and enticing for them. But in 2021, we went back to, um, in, in person, but we still have a couple of online classes because we found that it, there is a need. People, some people want to learn online through online. So we have some of those too. And then last year, we've got to catch up. There we go. Last year, um, we, we have 95 years of adult education. And so in December, we started talking about that and we're hoping that to have a school-wide celebration, hopefully in April of this year, celebrating 95 years. So it was kind of, a, kind of exciting that we've been going that long. And the governance piece. What do you know about governance? Well, 
we have a thing called a consortium. And um, Dr. Farah Sabah is the chair, and he, you know, works for the Santa Cruz County. He's the superintendent, the COE. Then Matt Weinstein, Dr. Um, Wetstein, he is the vice chair. Michelle was on this panel, but now I am. Um, Chris Monroe from Santa Cruz City, Andy Stone, and Linda Bernabe. So those are the people that are involved in the governance of this, the consortium that distributes funds, although we are directly funded, which is a good thing. But then we also have another piece of governance. We have you, the Paro Valley Unified School District Board, and you're very important to us. But we also have Santa Cruz City Schools. Chris Monroe is a member of the consortium, and sometimes these people come to join our Community Advisory Council. They want to know what's going on at their piece of the pie, what's happening with La Fonda. Um, even though they're not involved because they, they have contributed no funds, they still are very much interested in what is happening at the school. So they, we end up talking to both boards. I work with both maintenance staffs. Um, there's just, there's a lot um, because it's different. They're not part of us. <laughs> you can ask our maintenance people. Something happens and the custodian needs to clean and it's like, well, who's going to drive to Santa Cruz? Um, and we say, well, Santa Cruz, how about you? You want to help us out? Well, no, you're, you're supposed to take care of it. These are your employees. So uh, there's just a lot of things that are challenges and you never know what's going to happen, but it's fun. You know, it's a challenge, but it's fun. Then, then we get into our funding. Um, we have what's called CAPE. That's the California Adult Education Program. That's state funding. Then we have WIOA. That's the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, Title II. It's federal-based on payment points, pre- and post-tests. So when a student comes to our school, they are given a pre-test, all of them. It's called a CASAS test. And what we do, when we, then we figure out what class to put them in, what level of um, ESL do they need, what level. So we place them. Then we have a post-test because that's how our funding is given. So we have to find out, did they make progress? How much progress? We could not do this without our classified staff. We were talking about it today with the teachers because the teachers used to have to come in and we have a new student and they test them but they have all these students over here where they had to teach. So how do they test and teach at the same time? It's a challenge. So our classified staff now, it's part of the registration process. When they come in, sign up, they know what to do, they get them ready, they get them tested. So that's uh, another part. We're, we are, we're a, you know, integrated, um, our team is so interrelated. The teachers, the classified, everybody is really important in this whole process. The Workforce Development Board, um, Eric sits on that board because that had to be a Board of Supervisors um, appointment and we wanted to make sure it was our school that was represented and um, the Assistant Director position is the one that goes to those meetings now. So we are, we owe a Title, a title I eligible training, the ETPL, that's a whole nother thing. Um, then we have scholarships in our community, people that really decide to support our school. Bay Federal Credit Union, Home Depot, Moss Mock, Martinelli's, the Paro Valley Community Health Trust, uh, Seroptimus, Watsonville Rotary, and they're always here to help us out. Uh, if there's anything we need, they're right here. We call uh, Martin Martinelli's and say, we're having a celebration, here's some cider. We call McDonald's, we say, we're having a celebration, here's some food. I mean, people are really generous and really supportive of the school and the staff. Christmas time, um, McDonald's brought over some food for the staff. Cookies, hamburgers, coupons, all, always d um, giving us whatever, whenever they decide. Then we have the CINIS grant. And this is something new, the Citizenship Instruction and Natural Naturalization Application Services. We applied for a grant, I think this is the third time, only this year we got it. And it's with the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. We had to submit for this federal grant. We were only one of 65 to be awarded the grant nationwide. And the goal is to increase the number of citizenship students by 200 over two years. Will we meet that goal? I don't know, but we're certainly trying. And with CAB, they keep sending us students, so we're 
keep going with our citizenship classes and trying to build the program. Then we have state support. Well, that California Department of, um, of Adult Education, they're there, Department of Education, we are in the adult education component. We have uh, the California Adult Literacy Professional Development, CalPRO, so we work with them. And then I told you about CASAS, the Comprehensive Adult Student Assessment System, and then Outreach and Technical Assistant Network, OTAN. There are so many acronyms in adult education, it takes you a year to figure all this out, but uh, it's there. Um, our organizations, we're involved with AXA. We're involved um, with the California Council for Adult Education, CCAE, and we have a chapter locally, the Steinbeck chapter, that um, Monterey, Salinas, Watsonville, we're all involved in that chapter, the Steinbeck chapter. Then we have CAIA, that's the California Adult Education Administrators Association. And COAB, that's a coalition of adult ed um, basic education, that's a nationwide one. And then we have our local community advisory council. And trying to keep all of these things going and, and hands in all the pots, you can learn something new every day. I'm telling you, there are changes all the time. So our, our spring classes have begun. We have ESL, we have uh, the places that we're going, and our driver's training, I don't know if I mentioned it later, but I'll mention it right now. We are in a, uh, a collaborative process with expanded learning, where we are hoping to have all high school students take driver's training at no cost. It'll be through them, through us, because I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, I wanted to know how to drive. And we took the class and everybody got through and everybody went to a driving class. And people knew how to drive. Well now, there is no driving class at the high school. So it's kind of like, well how come? How do kids drive? And they come and they pay to go through adult ed. Parents do it, but some, can they afford it? Well then they just go out and drive. But this is gonna be, a, I think, a really good collaboration for our district that um, Expanded Learning wants to do it, and I've talked to our teachers, and I think we can do it. The one drawback, just so you know, is adult education teachers, getting them um, credentialed in driving, they don't offer the program. So we're trying to figure out how we can expand that piece. There are many challenges, but we will figure it out, one at a time. So what are our programs? Adults with Disabilities. English as a second language, including citizenship, career and technical education, uh, the learning center. This is where we take people that can have very low skills, basic skills, but they can study and then progress. Th and they're elementary and middle school. People maybe they didn't have an opportunity to go to school, but now they come and they say, I want to go to school. Um, and then they get their um, adult secondary education, whether it's the high school diploma or whether it's GED, one or the other. I had a student come in and she said, I brought my mom. And I said, your mom? She said, yep, she's going to get her GED. And I said, what about you? And she said, well, I finished college, but my mom didn't have time. And she's going to come back and she's going to get her GED and she's going to get to college too. And I thought, you know, that, that's, I mean, it's just, you never know what kind of stories you're going to hear in adult ed. They're, they're just so heartwarming. And then we have our adults in training for um, school child success. That's our parent education, vibrant program. And then fee, fee support. So let's talk a little bit about adults with disabilities. We work with the Department of Rehabilitation. We offer the work keys curriculum. Um, the assessment so far has mainly just been in truck driving school. And we, I would say this is not, um, we need to do more in this area. This is an area we need to grow in, is with our adults with disabilities. Then we have our career technical education. We continue to expand in this program. We have the certified nursing assistant program, theory and clinical. They work in the convalescent homes. We have the CMA, where they do thin, uh, theory and clinical, the cl clinical medical assistance. Then we have an administrative medical assistant program, dental assisting program, EKG, um, certified home health aid, the caregivers, 
medical terminology, pharmacy technician, a lot of different options for different people. And we have a picture of the various people that were in the programs, the costs of the programs, and a lot of times in the past we've gotten help from the Workforce Development Board with funding for these students. However, right now they're saying they don't have money, so we're looking at other options. And then more CTE areas. Well, you know that we opened the cosmetology program. And they have to do a prerequisite is they have to have their high school diploma. That's required by the state of California. So what we say is, hey, get your high school diploma and then get into cosmetology or get into the CNA or whatever your interests are. We try to build it. Um, you have to have 1,000 hours in order to take the state board exam. And we have comp um, computer and Chromebook skills with Spanish support. We have a pre-apprenticeship program with the building trades. We had that last year. Um, they were very excited at, at graduation. And we were having it again this year. It's 144 hours to complete the course. We have uh, Microsoft Office, our applications programs, Google applications, QuickBooks, um, WorkKeys, the National Career Readiness. This is a picture of our cosmetology students. And what, w and let's go to the next one too. And there they are, there's our lab. If you have been downtown, great. And if you haven't, you might wanna drop by sometime and see the students in action. We had to convert our lobby into a salon. So there we are. And couldn't have done it without maintenance. <laughs> maintenance, they've been great. So um, what, what about our students? Where have they gone? Uh, we're missing a slide. Uh, so let me talk first. Um, there's a slide that talks about the cosmetology program, and it's an update of where the students are. So the Haley, this one Haley, she's licensed, and she works in the field um, at Santa Cruz Thread Skin, Skin Care on the west side. Then there's Araceli, she's licensed. She works in the field at the Color Room in Watsonville. Zuli is licensed. She works at the field as an independent hair extensions lash technician. Amanda, she works in the field at a hair salon in Capitola. Bridget, she works in the field as a receptionist stylist at Ultra Beauty in Salinas. Um, so what I'm saying is they've gotten jobs and they're really excited. We have a couple that have completed the course and they just haven't finished getting a job yet, but they are out there and they're working. And that's this slide that's kind of missing, but it's there. Okay, then we have our pre-apprenticeship program. Pre-apprenticeship, class of 2023, this is what we did. We're getting ready to start a new program. Go to the next one, we gotta move it. Uh, Pre-apprenticeship, here we go. We're getting ready February 21st, so it's coming up next week. It's on the consent agenda if that's providing you support it. Um, and then we have, um, I think I'll skip some of this because I know we're running out of time. But. We have our integrated education and training, the IET program. We have English learners, ESL, I kind of told you where they are. Our levels, all of the different levels that we have. Um, and how those pre and post tests are so important. They get in, take a pre-test, we need them a post test after 40 hours and that's the amount of money that we got last year or this year. So we have some pictures that we showed your, our English learners, classes are full, people are busy, um, teachers love it. And I tell you, without the teachers, the school wouldn't go. We have uh, the citizenship. You can see that we offer a couple of classes downtown. Here's the pictures of the citizenship students. We have the learning center where they get their high school diploma. They're working with um, Apex and Aztec. They get a GED. We're the only GED testing center in the county. So they come here and we do that Wednesday nights. Um, then we're in collaboration with Cabrillo College. We, we have a math class on their campus right now, but it's an adult ed class. And then we have our adults training with um, child, child success. We have the co-op um, at Linscott. We have Santa Cruz, three schools there. And then fee support, we have a birding class that's outstanding. People love it because we have the birds, ceramics, the community band, 77 years, the band. Um, driver's training, smart driver's art, foreign languages, Croatian and culture, and we're hoping to add Spanish soon. You want me to quit, Marie? 
Dr. Bills, I was just going to say we're over five minutes and we do have public comment on okay. it. So I'll need to ask you to wrap up. Okay. Everybody on task is That's all right. Sorry. This is, this is uh, just more facts and more things, but you, we're good. And we have this in our backup. Okay, this yes, you do. Attached to the agenda. Thank you okay. so much, Dr. Vilsich. Thank you. Um, and I know we have public comment. Yes, we do. We have one speaker. Okay. Roddy Kirkman. Go for it. Good evening again, trustees, superintendent. Um, so PVFT, we are extremely proud to represent our adult educators um, and counselors. We know that this program is one of the cornerstones of our district. So it's nice to honor all of the people that make it work. Um, I do wanna share some about our adult ed staff. As you saw in that presentation, there are ESL classes that are full, full, full and are even waitlisted. There is postings for ESL teachers and um, we're just not getting anybody in. So those students are not getting into those classes. We have the majority of our adult ed educators are part time. Um, that means they work under 18 hours a week and they have offered to take on those classes if they could split them up so that our students could be served. Mm -hmm. But they were denied that request because once they hit 18 hours, according to our contract, they get health benefits and they do not wanna pay them to have health benefits. I don't know if you know, but our adult ed staff do not have any prep time in their schedules. That means anything they prepare for their classes to, to teach, that is done on their own personal time. They're paid only the hours weekly that they work. <laughs> our adult ed teachers, I think one of them came up, she had students in her, um, on her caseload that were from 18, I think she said, to 83. They serve our entire county. And these teachers, as Nancy mentioned, Ms. Phyllis, Ms. Phyllis mentioned, they actually are the ones who provide all of these services and make this program run. So we should be providing more to them because they are the ones who make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Roddy. And is that all of our public comment? Yes, that is all. Perfect. Thank you. And now bring it back to the board. Questions, comments, discussion? Trustee Bolano, staff? Yes, thank you for that presentation. Um, cosmetology, I'm just curious, you know, people want to poo poo that and sometimes think, oh, that's kind of, that ain't too glamorous. But actually, I, I know hairstylists that make good money. It's better. How did that program come to fruition and how's that program going? And We had a, um, a teacher who wanted to do it and came to us with the idea. Actually, um, he was a friend of uh, the previous assistant director, Todd Livingstone. We sat down and talked and figured out, could we do this? How would it work? We had to get, um, we had to have state approval to have the facility so would they accept our design and our square footage? You had to go through a, a big thing to get that done. We had picked um, another site in the district office and there wasn't enough square footage. So we went downtown and I think it's much better there because it's visible. People sometimes come in and say, oh, can I get my hair cut? You know, that kind of thing. It's, and the students are just excited. You need to go see. Mm -hmm. they're, they're excited, they love it. Um, instruction is in one part where they do the hours and the book work, and then there's um, the lobby where they do the actual um, hair cutting and nails and everything there. I was gonna ask, uh, as a board member, do I have any privileges in getting a little hair trim? Because, you know, I can't cut my hair back here. <laughs> Ever since the pandemic, I just can't get behind my, myself, so can I? I'll uh, bet if you drop by, they would assist you. Okay, all right then. And is there like a cooking or a baking thing going on over there? At the, are we always that part of our offering? We used to have a cake decorating class. Um, the lady retired, and we haven't found a replacement yet, but she, she was great. People loved her, and it was, uh, she mainly did it in Spanish, and people have left that her class. There was no stove or ovens. They bring in their cakes and do all the decorating, and then they go out and they have jobs. It, you know, like you need a birthday cake? Okay, I'll take care of it for you, that kind of thing. They did, they, and some of them went to work in bakeries. 
Do we have any stoves or ovens or co cooking facilities in our facilities? No. We do not. Mm. We talked about possibly putting one in room six, but we haven't pursued it because of the venting and everything else. But okay. maybe. I don't know. Someday. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Trustee Palosco. Anyone else? Trustee DeSerpa? Thank you. Um, this is one of the most joyous graduations that I go to um, at the, uh, or that a trustee can go to at the end of the year. The graduation is, was amazing last year and uh, Marilena yeah. De La Garza um, did such an inspiring speech that I was crying actually at the end of it. She's amazing. So thank you for bringing her in too. She to uh, inspire you know, the families. It was beautiful. Oh, it was. Mm -hmm. You know, it was. She, um, and well, you know, we all are interactive someplace and we meet each other and talk and, you know, I, I asked her, I said, hey, how about this? She's good. She's very good. Yeah. It was great. Thank you. So I, I wanted to talk about one of the slides that you didn't actually get to, but is, um, is attendance up? The same or down? Well, if you year, look at the attendance, it, sho it shows a 19 something uh -huh. on a on a slide. But then you have one that shows where we are now is 18 something. So by the end of the year, we should probably be about the same. Okay, and is that from year to year? Is that about on par, or is that higher? Well, I would say um, since the pandemic, we're still building, but to have close to 2,000 students is great. And, uh, you know, we can't, if we can find more teachers and hire more teachers, we will have more classes. That's great. Thank you, Nancy. And Thank thanks you. for all your work. We're all in it all together. All these years, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else? Welcome. The trades. Uh, tr Trustee Dr. Holm. I just want to express my thanks. You know, it's, it's. The courses that you offer are great for the, the community, and you know, it's like what uh, Trustee DeSerpa said. The the graduation was great, and it's like the cosmetology students they had the best colored hair, <laughs> 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 you know, at the graduation, and, it, and 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 their their joy in it was so palpable that that it's like, but that visible connection, you know, like the, there was that sense of pride, and like look at what I did. It, it really is uh, heartwarming to see that graduation because it's the cosmetology students, but then it's the pre-apprenticeship, yeah. and then it's the high school diploma. I mean, and they have the families. Yeah. You know, look what I did. Yeah. So. You know, and it's like, and then you know, see the pre-apprenticeship. You know, like seeing you know Ron Cheshire up there, and you know, and all those folks. And you know, it's like, you know, they're 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 they're, they're proud of their folks. You know, and it's like, all right. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Yes, thank you, Trustee Dr. Holman. Thank you, uh, Vice President Soto, also for your um, gratitude to Dr. Bilicich and her work she's doing. Um, so I'll just come in and with the same, you know, and thank you for what you've also, you're, I know I've said it in the past, for what you've done to take on with um, Santa Cruz because you are the largest adult ed now <laughs> in yeah. the county, <laughs> um, right? Um, right? Probably the largest, one of the largest in the region, probably. Um, or Might about be. there, yeah, yeah, and so, and that's a lot of work to take that on countywide. So appreciative of your willingness to support the county as a whole and not let that go. Um, and thanks for your very thorough presentation. And then I will see you next week at advisory. All right, Edu great adult education advisory committee, and um, have a good night. All right, thank you so much. And you know, we can't do it without the board either. Your support means a lot to us. And when, when the teachers are talking, it's like, but we have the board, no matter what, we have the board behind us. And that makes a big difference. You, you are very important in your roles. So don't, don't ever forget that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dessert. <coughs> okay, and now we will move to consent agenda. Uh, these consent items are routine items coming before the board. Are are there any public speakers to the consent agenda? Oh, we have none. Okay. Are there any items that any board member would wish to defer? N seeing none, then can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve our consent agenda. Perfect. I'll, I'll second. 
Perfect. So I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay. Motion carries 502. Thank you. And let's scratch that. Yeah. At, move to item 14.1 action on uh, report on closed session. Are there any items to report from closed session? Mm, yes, we have two. So as of tonight's meeting, February 14th, 2024. Uh, we have motion number one, which is closed session item 2.3. So I move to approve the certified personnel report as presented by district administration on February 14th with 10 and 16 additional action items. President Acosta, if I could ask for a second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion carries 502. Yes. And motion number two in connection with closed session item 2.4. So I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on February 14th, 2024, Valentine's Day, with 15 and 17 additional action items. President Acosta, if I could uh, ask for a second. I'll second. All those in favor? Just clarification, you meant 2.3, correct? Uh, I think I said 2.4. What's the... I have, have, have 2.3 2. 3 and 2.4 on my list. Oh, yep, so sorry. So the first one would have actually been 2.2, 2. 2. 2, okay. just for clarification. And the second is 2.3. Sorry, All that's right. not your error. As presented, it was 2.2, 2.3. My mistake, exactly. sorry. Okay. Brian. Brian. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, first, second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion will carry 502. Um, announcement about our upcoming board meetings. Our next meetings are um, a special board meeting on February 17th at 8 a.m. and a special board meeting on February, February 17th at 8 a.m. and a special board meeting on February 18th at 9 a.m. to interview superintendent applicants. Our next regular board meeting is on February 28th, 2024, followed by a special board meeting on February 29th regarding declining enrollment. I will now adjourn this meeting at 11 o'clock p.m. Thank you all for spending your Valentine's Day with us.